Thank you very much, Brother Aladawa. So before we start this event, uh, I want to make sure uh, to inform people why we are hosting this event as your college Muslim student at MSA. We're, so, we're seeking to host a respectful and friendly dialogue debate between two key figures, David Wood and Muhammad Hijab. Both of these respected figures have expertise in their core beliefs. That said, the topic of the debate will be Trinity or Tawheed. The debate will focus on the essence of God from both Christian and Muslim perspectives. It will be, a, it will be an educational discussion platform expanding on core theological concepts. There will be significant references exchanged both from the Quran and the Bible. Uh, so before we start, I just want to make sure that the audience has have this clear. Uh, uh, we sh there are going to be multiple opinions in this in this debate. So I don't want anyone to feel offended. This is we're here to learn about each other's uh, each other's op opinions. If you feel easily offended, please do not react. And at the same time, if any of the speakers make any uh, make any statement that you feel that is a very good statement or you feel that you agree with. Clapping is sufficient. We don't want any verbal cheering or something like that. This is a very, this is a very educational debate. Clapping is sufficient. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my co-moderator, uh, Brother Salim Rahim. Uh, so this is how the format of the debate is gonna start. Um, we're gonna have 20 minute opening statements for each speaker. Then there's gonna be 12 minute first rebuttals, and then eight minute second rebuttals, then crossfire examination where, where the speakers will be asking each other questions. Each speaker will have six questions to ask the other speaker, and it will take two minutes to answer each of the questions. Then we're gonna have five minute conclusions. Then as you can see, there are mics in, at the front where there's gonna be a Q&A session where you can ask, uh, where you can ask uh, our, brothers, uh, uh, our brother uh, uh, Muhammad uh, Hijab and David Wood any questions if you have. Please keep everything respectful. If, there's, if there are any, uh, any disrespectful remarks, you, you will be escorted out. So without further ado, introducing our first speaker, Dr. David Wood. So just a little background on Dr. David Wood. He's a Christian evangelist and preacher. David Wood is a member of a society of Christian philosophers the Evangelical Philosophical Society, and the Hume Society. He was a former atheist. David became a Christian after examining the historical evidence of the resurrection of G Jesus. He's a contributor to the book's Evidence for God, 50 Arguments for Faith from the Bible, History, Philosophy, and Science, Defending the Resurrection and True Reason. Christian Responses to the Challenge of Atheism, David has a PhD in philosophy from Fordham University and has been in more than 60 moderated public debates with Muslim, atheists, and other Christians. And uh, that's a little background on our first spe key speaker, Dr. David Wood. And without further ado, introducing our, uh, his opposition, uh, Brother Muhammad Hijab. A little background on uh, uh, Brother Muhammad Hijab. He's an academic researcher and media host. Uh, he is a debater and public speaker who engages in discussions and polemics on a wide variety of topics, including religion, politics, and society. He completed a politics degree and a master's in history from Queens Mary University. He has taught and instructed courses on humanities and languages in many contexts. He has numerous ijazas and some Islamic sciences and has studied in multiple Islamic seminaries, in, including the Shankiti Institute, which employs a traditional Marisian style of teaching the sacred sciences. Mr. Hijab is currently doing further postgraduate research in Islamic studies at the School of Advanced Study University of London. Uh, so, uh, like I said, just please keep everything that I said in mind, and uh, I think we will start with uh, uh, Brother Muhammad Hijab giving us his 20-minute uh, opening statement. You know, the Quran tells us, "Ta'alu ila kalimatin sawa bainana wa bainakum illa na'budu illallah." The first thing we're asked to do when we're engaging with Christian people is to come to common terms that we worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's something we really need to think about we need to think about the common grounds that we have with Christians there's lots in common we believe in Jesus Christ we believe in the Messiah we believe in him we love the Messiah we believe Jesus we believe that he was born from the Virgin Mary there's a whole chapter in the Quran dedicated to her 
But of course, the elephant in the room or the difference of opinion is in the fact that we as Muslims do not believe that Jesus was divine or that the Holy Spirit is divine. Today's discussion, ladies and gentlemen, is about Tawheed and Trinity. Tawheed is monotheism, to believe and worship in one God. The Quran says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad. That say he is Allah, one and only, the eternally besought of all, the sovereign. The Trinity is defined by the Athanasian Creed in 500 AD, Athanasian Creed, as one divine person, that one divine being divided into three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But there are not three gods, but one God. It goes. The Father is almighty. The Son is almighty. And the Holy Spirit is almighty. But there are not three almighties. There's one almighty. This is what the Athanasian Creed says. Now, to be honest with you, I've heard David Wood speak before. And I've noticed that there are three common fallacies that he falls into quite often. One of them is a fallacy called the Tukokui fallacy, which is an appeal to hypocrisy. Another one is a straw man. And a third one is the red herring. These three fallacies are employed by him quite often. And he talks about Islam extensively, as you guys may know, in a negative way. Salam Initiative has put up a database of all of the major misconceptions against Islam being answered, and this can be seen in the link below. I also want to give credit to um, one team member who has made a website called Many Prophets, One Message, which can also be seen in the link below. You can see more information about that. Now, to cut straight into it, the question now is this. The question is, when we look at the Old Testament, do we find this idea of the Nicene Trinity? Because the Nicene Trinity is very specific. After the Constantinople Creed in 381, the idea that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three co-equal, co-eternal, independent beings. Remember those words. Co-equal, co-eternal, independent persons of the one being of God. This is the Nicene understanding of the Trinity. Now, having said that, guys, when you look at the Old Testament, do we see this? Because when we look at the Old Testament, we find the Shema, chapter 6, verse 4, Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad, Hero Israel, my Lord, our Lord is one Lord. Here, when you look at the first commandment, chapter 20, verse 3 of Exodus, you find there's no God beside me. I'm your Lord and there's no God beside me. You find in Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 11, once again, the discussion of, I am your God and besides me there is no savior. Now someone might argue, but the word Elohim, and this is the weakness of the argument. It's a weak linguistic argument. The word Elohim is a majestic plural, they would argue. Look, there are 9,000 pronouns in the Bible which relate to God's name. Let's take, for example, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Bereshit, Bereshit, Bara, Elohim. The word Bara means he created. Whenever you find a pronoun in the Old Testament referring to Elohim, you will always find it in third person male singular. One more time. Third person male singular. You don't find a plural version of that. You don't find a pronoun which is pluralized. So now the question would be is this. A Jew who is acquainted with the Torah, with the Old Testament, why would one ask him to realign his belief, his theological doctrines, into believing in a triune God, when in fact he's been instructed quite explicitly in fact in the Old Testament not to break the commandments? You see... It gets a little bit more interesting even when you look at the New Testament. Now, we know the New Testament has different authors. There's 27 books of the New Testament. You've got Paul, who's written from 7 to 13 books, and there's dispute as to exactly how much is written. John, written many books. Who is John? We don't know who John is, by the way. We don't know who John is. But, yes, Paul had 
a kind of exaltation Christology. There's no doubt. He did believe that Jesus was divine. And a good example of that is the uh, second Philippians, the hymn. But he believed in a kind of subordinationism. And how do we know that? Because if you look at line 9 to 11, it's quite explicit that God gives him the name. So he didn't have it before. Jesus did not have the name before, and he makes it above all names. So that he believes in a kind of subordinationism. Now, what is subordinationism? It's a hierarchy within the Trinity. Remember, we said the Nicene Trinity is three co-equal, co-eternal persons of the, the Godhead. Paul didn't believe this. He believes in a hierarchy. John believed in an incarnation Christology. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Everyone knows the prologue. John chapter 1, yeah? But the question is this, who is, who is John? His, his gospel was found some 95 AD. This is the time it was found, 95 AD. That's some 65 years after Jesus' disappearance. The irony of it all is that you'll find in the gospel of John, for example, passages like John 17.3, where it explicitly mentions that the Father is the only true God. Explicitly mentions this. And this was such a thorn in the side of the church fathers that Augustine, a major church father who died 430 AD and he wrote, who wrote an exegesis on John. Do you know what he said? He rearranged the words of John chapter 17 verse 3. He changed the word order so as to make Jesus and the Father the true gods. This is how severe it was. When you find Mark chapter 12 verse 29, the Jew came to Jesus asking how to be saved. And what did Jesus say? Did Jesus say, and Mark by the way is the most ancient manuscript of all of the gospels, or most ancient gospels. What did Jesus say? Did he say, you have to believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as co-equal, co-eternal, independent beings? He said no. He said, he referred him to the Shema, chapter 6, verse 4 of Deuteronomy. That's what he referred him to. He didn't tell him, believe me as God, or believe the Holy Spirit as God, or all these things, no. So you see, really and truly, the question is, where do people, Christians today, where do they get their information of the Trinity? You'll find that in Matthew... Chapter 28, verse 19, it talks about, it's, it's called the baptismal formula, where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is mentioned, go in the way, baptized in the way the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so Christians use this as to prove, okay, the Trinity is in the Bible now. They use this to say, look, the Trinity is in the Bible now. But why don't they look at Luke chapter 9, verse 26? Because Luke chapter 9, verse 26 has a different triadic formula, where there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Angels. Yes, the holy angels, not the Holy Spirit. So why don't we infer a trinity from this? This is the question. Now, we've had these debates before and they've been done before. And it's usually, okay, we'll get a vague verse here, an ambiguous verse here, and we'll start talking about these things. But here's an interesting question now. How did the earliest generations of Christians interpret the New Testament corpus? You have church fathers who are the most learned men of Christendom. People like Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Origen. People like those individuals. None of those church fathers for the first 300 years, listen to what I'm saying, none of those church fathers for the first 300 years of church history inferred a Nicene Trinity from this. Can you imagine? <laughs> 300 years. 10 minutes if, left. Even Tertullian, who died 240 AD. Tertullian, who dubbed or coined the term Trinitas, which was later translated into Trinity. He was a subordinationist. He believed the hierarchy within the different persons of the Godhead. The interesting point here is you have someone like you have someone like Hilopolis. He 
was taught by Irenaeus, massive church father, Justin Martyr, massive church father. He taught Origin of Alexandria, massive church father. And he writes in his book Against the Heresies in chapter 22. What does he write? He talks about this group called the Ebionites, who were around, around 70 AD, 40 years after the disappearance of Jesus. And they believed that Jesus was not God, that he was a prophet, and that he was the Messiah. There were other groups like the Monarchianists who believed the non-divinity of Jesus. It wasn't just the Ebionites. Some Monarchianists also believed that Jesus was not divine in the way that Trinitarians make it out to be. No one spoke about the Holy Spirit being God, co-equal and co-eternal and independent with the Father and the Son in the first 300 years. That discussion is completely gone. So this is quite interesting, ladies and gentlemen. You know why? Because you could say from this that where the Islamic position of the non-divinity of Jesus and the non-divinity of the Holy Spirit was represented in the early church, the Nicene Trinitarian position was not. Oh, wait, say that one more time. He wants to hear it. Okay. Where the Islamic position of the non-divinity of Jesus Christ was present and the non-divinity of the Holy Spirit was present in early Christian church history, the Nicene Trinitarian understanding of the post-Constantinople creed was not. Prove me wrong. David, prove me wrong. Give me one person for the first 300 years of church history that detailed co-equal, co-eternal, independent Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Give me. Silence me. Prove me wrong. I want to be proven wrong today. I want to be proven wrong today. Silence me. Tell me one church father for the first 300 years of church history that said the Holy Spirit was co-equal, co-eternal, independent with the Father and the Son. Please, please give me, the, give me the records. It's a historical investigation. Just give me one. I will be quiet. I will apologize. I will apologize in front of everyone. I will apologize in front of everyone. Yes. Now, it gets a little bit more sticky than that because if you look at a book called The Christian Doctrines, Early Christian Doctrines by J.N.D. Kelly, conservative Christian scholar. He details exactly how this Trinitarian, Nicene Trinitarian uh, thing came about. If you look at chapter 5, it's a very interesting read. Go and read it. It says that you had, for example, Athanasius, who was a very ardent Trinitarian around Nicene times. And then you have Hilary of Pontiers. They were advocating the Trinitarian position. Then you had the Cappadocian fathers, who are Gre Gregory of Nizanzias, Gregory of Nyssa, and Basil the Great. And they, Basil the so-called Great, they are the ones who advanced the Trinitarian position. The question is, who gave those guys the authority to, uh, to interpret texts like this? And to overrule all the things that came before? Why? Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the rationality of the Trinity, because this has to be mentioned. Now, the, tr the Trinity, as Thomas Jefferson mentioned, is an unintelligible, this is what he says, an unintelligible idea of platonic mysticisms that three are one. It's a contradiction, ladies and gentlemen, that you have Father Almighty, Son Almighty, uh, Holy Spirit is Almighty, but there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. That's a contradiction. That's why Randolph Ro Ross wrote in his book, Common Sense Christianity, talking about the hypostatic union, because now you have Jesus, who's 100% man and 100% God. <laughs> Tell me what is a contradiction if that isn't. It's like saying X is 100% a square and 100% a circle. Randolph Ross, he dismissed it. He says it's impossible. I can't believe this. He's a Christian. Now, as it's mentioned in, Five the, minutes left. in, in the introduction, in the introduction he, he mentioned that David Wood is part of the Evangelical Christian Philosophical Society. His boss and superior, someone called Paul Copen, Paul Copen, wrote a whole thing talking about, because, talking about social Trinitarianism. And basically, he tries to reason in the same way as Nabil Qureshi did in his previous debate, by the way, with Shabir Ali. He says that, look, the way it works is, he said, look, I'm a being and you're a being. Yes? I am Muhammad Hijab. I'm a being. I'm a human being. David Wood is a human being. But... How is differentiated from who? That's what he said. 
How is differentiated from who? This is the idea that Paul Copen and William Lane Craig and these uh, social Trinitarians believe in. That how is differentiated from who? That's not correct. That's false. You know why? Because you can only differentiate from how from who when you have a multiplicity of instantiations in any given genus. Say that one more time. When you have a multiplicity of instantiations in any given genus, in any given class. Let me tell you what I mean. I can't differentiate between me, Muhammad Higab, and David Wood unless there's two of us. Because if there was one human being, the how, the who would be the, the what. Say that one more time. If there was one human being, the who would be the what, and the what would be the who. There would be no differentiation. You have to establish now, and this is the third thing I want to say, how you can have a differentiation from who and how without having a multiplicity of instantiations in any given genus. Which means you have to admit first that there is more than one God for you to differentiate between them as persons. And by the way, this is an unbiblical, unscriptural thing. The differentiation between person and a being. It's an unbiblical thing. I would like to see if it is in the Bible, where it is in the Bible. So just to summarize what I've said, because I've only got three minutes left. These are the questions I want the answers to today. Question one. Why is it that in the Old Testament, you do not find the Trinity mentioned or inferred and if it was inferred, why haven't the rabbis, the Jewish scholars, for 4,000 years of Hebrew history inferred it? That's question one. Question two. How is it the case that if the Trinity is explicit in the New Testament, that for 300 years of church history, Nicene Trinitarianism was not inferred by the church fathers? Question three. Where, give me one person of the first 300 years that says that the Holy Spirit was co-eternal, co-equal, independent with God. One name. I will apologize in front of everyone today. Yes, I will apologize. Question four. How is it the case that how can you rationalize this contradiction of the Trinity? When you have a hypostatic union, someone who's 100% man and 100% God, are you telling me to believe in a squared circle today, sir? Is that, the, is that what you have for me? You want me to become a Trinitarian squared circle? And then you have another thing. The Father is almighty. The Son is almighty. And the Holy Spirit is almighty. The Quran refuses. Chapter 23, verse 91. La'ala ba'dahum ala ba'd. If this was the case, they would have tried to outstrip each other. Deal with the Qur'anic argument. You like to attack the Qur'an? You will see today that the Qur'anic argument will suffocate you. It will suffocate you. <laughs> Number five. One minute left. In fact, I think four questions is a lot for this man. If he can do with four, I'll be grateful to him. I want to say one thing before I, before I, you might be thinking, why are you being quite firm with this man today? You know, James White, he's a very respectable scholar of Christianity, and he's a good man. Yes, he is. And he refuted this man because of his mockery. This man makes mockumentaries against Muslims. And he refuted him on the basis of a verse in the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where it says, be respectful and honorable. What is the point of causing social discohesion? What is the point of attacking a people, making a mockumentary of Muslims, drawing the prophet, uh, putting him in the thumbnail, all those things, and you know it's going to offend the Muslim community? Isn't it high time in the age of, isn't it high time in the age of Islamophobia Five seconds. and racism that we stop this? Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Brother Muhammad Hajjah, for that wonderful opening statement. And uh, now, without further ado, we have Dr. David Wood with his first 20 minutes of opening statement. He jammed this thing in there. <laughs> All right, I'll just leave it like that. 
can overcome that strength. All right, well, good evening. I'd like to thank uh, Mohammed Hijab for challenging me to this debate and for crossing the Atlantic Ocean so that uh, we can share our thoughts with you. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Grassroots Dawa and the Muslim Students Association and uh, all the other groups that were involved in organizing and uh, planning and hosting. Um, my prediction is that tonight will be what, uh, what young people call epic. See, Now, what's the difference between the Trinity and Tawheed? Well, one is admittedly so utterly confusing that people wonder how it can possibly be true. The other is the Trinity. Yes, you're going to find out that I think that the doctrine of Tawheed, which oddly enough we didn't hear much about in uh, Muhammad Hijab's opening statement, uh, I'm convinced that the doctrine of Tawheed, at least as it was taught by Muhammad, is vastly more confusing than we hear about today. So let's compare them, and we'll start with the Trinity. Why do Christians believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? We believe it because we are forced into this view by the triune God, not because of uh, church councils. The church councils were forced into that view by the triune God. Um, for Christians, we have a certain amount of data that we work with. Everyone has some data, right? We look around, we see the world, we see that it's organized in certain ways, we know that there's a moral law. There are hundreds of millions of people in the world today who believe that they have witnessed miracles. All of this uh, helps us formulate a concept of God. Uh, but Christians also have the scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when we start reading uh, the scriptures, things get very interesting very quickly. Um, so these are the first two verses of the Bible, long before Christians came along. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we've got God, but then there's a distinction that says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Later in the same chapter, opening chapter of the Bible, verse 26, we read, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, two obvious questions. One, who was he talking to? And two, why does he say, let us plural, make man, plural, I mean, make man in our, plural, image. The plural of majesty, right? Well, the Jews didn't use the plural of majesty, so why is he using this? It's just a mystery so far. Um, we don't know yet, but as we continue reading, the mystery gets deeper. In Isaiah 9, 6, the prophet delivers a prophecy. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. A child is born, a son is given, and this child is said to be the Mighty God. How is a child going to be the Mighty God? In Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16, Yahweh is speaking, Yahweh is the speaker. And he says, draw near to me, hear this, from the beginning I have not spoken in secret, from the time it came to be I have been there, and now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Yahweh is speaking and Yahweh says that he has been sent by Yahweh along with the spirit of Yahweh. How can God be sent by God along with the spirit of God? Well, we just don't know. Still later in the Old Testament, Zechariah 12.10, Yahweh is again speaking, and he says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Yahweh will pour out a spirit which causes people to repent, and they will look on Yahweh, whom they have pierced, and mourn for him as one grieves for a lost son. How can 
an immaterial God be pierced unless he takes on a body. So the Old Testament concludes and leaves us with a lot of questions about how to reconcile the claim that there is only one God with some intriguing hints at plurality. Then Jesus comes along. Jesus tells his followers that he's the final judge of all people, even though the Old Testament says that Yahweh is the final judge of all people. Jesus says that he's the one who raises the dead at the resurrection, even though the Old Testament says that Yahweh is the one who raises the dead at the resurrection. Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. He claims to be the Lord of the prophet David. He claims to be the I am of the Exodus. He claims to be greater than God's temple. Jesus tells us that he has an absolutely unique relationship with the Father, that he can answer prayers, that he's present wherever his followers are gathered, that he is with his followers forever, and that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. He even makes the startling declaration that all things that the Father has are mine. But Jesus also prays to the Father, and he claims to be from the Father. Why would Jesus make claims that only God can make, yet also be drawing attention to God as the Father? In John 14 through 16, Jesus says that after he returns to the Father, he and the Father will together send the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is sent, and yet, as we've seen, the Spirit was with the Father at creation. Psalm 104 verse 30 says that the Spirit creates the universe. The Spirit is omniscient in 1 Corinthians, omnipresent in Psalm 139, and eternal in Hebrews 9. These are divine attributes, and yet the Spirit is distinct from the Father and the Son. So what do we do all with all of this? Well, if the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Spirit is God, and the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father, and there's only one God, the Trinity is the only way out. And that's why I said that we were forced into this view by the triune God himself. Now, my Muslim friends tell me that this concept of God is absurd, even though we got it from God through the missions of the Son and the Spirit. My Muslim friends tell me that I should reject this confusing concept of God and believe in something much simpler, the Islamic concept of God. But I've been going through your sources for a good little while now, and I see some serious problems with the doctrine of Tawheed. Let me give you a few examples. First, Allah prays. People ask, Jesus is God, why does he pray? I have to remind them that we're Trinitarians. It makes perfect sense for the Son to speak to the Father. It makes much less sense, given the Islamic concept of God, for Allah to pray. In Surah 33, verse 56 of the Quran, we read, Surely Allah and his angels pray for the prophet. O you who believe, pray for him and salute him with a worthy salutation. Allah and his angels pray for the prophet. Translators try to hide this by translating it as Allah and his angels send blessings or show mercy or they praise him. The problem here is that what it says Allah does is salah. And you know what that means. You know there are perfectly good Arabic ways of saying all of those other things. Every Arab speaker in the world knows that salah means prayer. And it says that Allah does salah. So, who is Allah praying to? Second, according to the Quran, most of Allah's parts will die. The Quran and the Hadith refer to Allah's face, his hands, two right hands, in fact, fingers, waist, shin, feet, and so on. Now, there's a tendency to interpret scriptural statements about God's bodily parts figuratively. If we say God's eyes see everything, no one thinks we're saying that God has eyeballs. But there are Muslim scholars themselves are the ones who are arguing that Descriptions of Allah's face and hands and feet and so on have to be interpreted literally, not simply anthropomorphically. 
Ten minutes left. So Allah has a literal face, literal hands, and so on. And yet, we read in the Quran, Surah 28, verse 88, everything will perish except Allah's face. Which means, if you, are, if you are taking these parts literally and the only thing that survives is Allah's face, then Allah's face has different attributes from the rest of his parts, uh, perishable versus imperishable. Third, the Quran is an eternal person. While Orthodox Islamic theology insists that the Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah and co-eternal with Allah, that would be interesting enough, we can't forget that according to Muhammad, the Quran is also a person who intercedes for Muslims. In Sahih Muslim, 1874, Muhammad says to his companions, recite the Quran, for it will come on the day of resurrection interceding for its companions. Now, how can a book intercede for people? Muhammad explains in Musnad Ahmed and Sunan Ibn Majah where he says, the Quran will meet its companion on the day of resurrection when his grave is opened for him in the form of a pale man. The Quran will say to him, do you recognize me? He will say, I do not recognize you. It will say, I am your companion, the Quran, who kept you thirsty on hot days and kept you awake at night. So the Quran, which is eternal and uncreated, appears as a pale man speaks to Muslims, and then speaks to Allah on their behalf. Again, this person, this pale man, is eternal. Fourth, the Quran isn't just personal, it's multi-personal. And I hear from Muslims that that's impossible. Even though the Quran is an eternal person who appears as a pale man and intercedes for Muslims, there are actually multiple persons within the one nature of the Quran. In Sunan Abu Dawud, 1400, Muhammad said, there is a surah in the Quran which consists of 30 verses. He's referring to Surat al-Mulk. It will intercede for its companion until he is forgiven. So a specific chapter of the Quran can appear and intercede for those who read it. But Muhammad isn't done. Sahih Muslim, 1874, he tells his followers to recite Surat al-Baqarah and Surat al-Imran because these surahs will come as two flocks of birds on the day of resurrection, pleading on behalf of the Muslims who recited them. Since Muhammad mentions three different surahs of the Quran, which have their own distinct personalities, their own knowledge, I think we can say that all of the surahs of the Quran have their own distinct personalities. The Quran Muslims read today is thus one in essence as the word of Allah, but 114 in person. The personal chapters come as flocks of birds pleading on behalf of Muslims. I see lots of Muslims smiling and laughing at this. This is what your prophet said. This is your prophet. I think it's funny too, but I try to, I try to, I try to hide that a little bit. Fifth, the multi-personal Quran has a mother. Christians claim that Jesus is the Son of God. The Quran responds in Surah 6, verse 101. How can Allah have a son when he has no wife? Notice that the Quran assumes that filial terms, talk, terms referring to offspring, have to be interpreted in a biological sense. Well, if we can only understand these terms biologically, we have to ask about the Quran's mother. Surah 13, verse 39. Allah blots out what he wills and confirms what he wills, and with him is the mother of the book. Um al-Khattab. The Quran's mother is in the presence of Allah. I would normally be happy with some metaphorical meaning of something like that, but it's the Quran itself which says that we have to interpret claims about Jesus being the Son of God biologically. So, if we have to interpret these claims biologically, then I have to say, if the Quran has a mommy, who's the daddy? Six, Allah's spirit who is eternal and the co-creator of life is a person. According to Islamic theology, nothing that is a part of Allah or that originates from within Allah is created. But the Quran says that Allah breathes out his spirit. This means that like Allah's eternal speech, the spirit comes from within Allah and is thus uncreated and eternal. 
Allah creates man in Surah 15 by fashioning a body out of clay and then breathing a spirit. Five minutes so left. The Quran says that Allah uh, strengthens Jesus by the spirit and that, the, uh, that uh, he strengthens all true believers with the spirit. But the spirit is a conscious agent who can appear in the form of a man. The spirit appears to Mary and speaks to her in Surah 19 and then breathes into her just as Allah breathed into clay to create Adam. So the spirit is an uncreated, eternal co-creator who is sent by Allah in the form of a man to perform certain tasks. And if he can uh, strengthen believers wherever they are, he would have to be omnipresent. Some divine attributes all over the place here. Seventh, Islam deifies Muhammad. When Muhammad would spit his companions would rush to collect the spit and they would rub it on their faces. They would struggle to, ha to save his used ablution water. If a hair fell off his head, they would rush to grab it. After the battle of Uhud, the Muhammad's companions, men named Malik, collected the blood that ran from Muhammad's wound and drank it. Muhammad said, the fire will never touch you. This isn't how you treat someone you regard as a mere human being. Today, however, no one can drink Muhammad's blood or rub his saliva on their faces, but Muslims still address him directly in their prayers. Most of the time when Muslims are praying, they're reciting words that are directed towards Allah. But there's a part of their daily prayers where they say, Assalamu alayka, ayyuhan nabiyu. Now that does not mean, God, please bless Muhammad. That is, peace be upon you, Muhammad. They're speaking, they're laughing, and they're speaking directly to Muhammad in their daily prayers. They're talking directly to Muhammad in their daily prayer. This assumes that he can hear them. And so he hears them all over the world, in which case he must be omnipresent. Interesting for a mere human being. Eighth, Islam deifies Jesus, without even realizing it. Allah is uncreated and eternal, but as we've seen, there are two uncreated and eternal persons with Allah, his word, his eternal speech, and the spirit that he breathes out. And yet, in Surah 4, verse 171, even when the Quran is asserting that he's only a prophet, it refers to Jesus as Allah's word and as a spirit from Allah. As if this weren't enough, Jesus goes on to create life in exactly the same way Allah creates life. Allah fashions a man out of clay and then breathes his spirit into it. What does Jesus do? He fashions a clay bird and then breathes his spirit into it. And this gives life. Jesus is co-creator. No wonder his followers started worshiping him. Ninth, Islamic worship draws extensively from the polytheism of seventh century Arabia. During the time of Muhammad, the polytheists of Arabia would perform tawaf, walking circles around the Kaaba. And why did they do that? Because they were following Abraham? No, they believed in seven planetary deities who circled the earth. And so they walked seven circles around the Kaaba in order to honor these seven planetary deities. Muslims do the same today, but not realizing where the practice came from. There's also the black stone. This was one of the pagan idols. It became part of Islam. You kiss it, and it can be an expiation for your sins. But according to Muhammad, the black stone itself is conscious. One minute left. We read in Termidi and Ibn Majah, the messenger of Allah said concerning the stone, by Allah, Allah will bring it forth on the day of resurrection, and it will have two eyes with which it will see, and a tongue with which it will speak, and it will testify in favor of those who touched it in sincerity. So this isn't a random, lifeless idol. This is a living, breathing idol. So in the Quran, we've got Allah swearing by literally uh, everything. We'll be talking about that in a little, in a few moments. Um, given that we find these things in the Muslim sources, I'm truly interested in how we can sit here and poke fun at the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, the real basis, I find, uh, for One reconciling second. these texts with 
the doctrine of Tawheed is that Muslim scholars don't let you know this stuff, which is why you think it's funny when you're hearing it. Time is up, Dr. Wood. <laughs> Uh, now we're going to start our second part, which is the 12-minute the rebuttal. And going first is Mr. Mohammed Hijab. You can go ahead. I think David Wood has said some career-ending embarrassing statements today. I mean, to be honest with you, after 20 years of researching Islam, you come with this. Okay, let's deal with one, one by one. Spirit of God hovered over the... Uh, hovered over after the God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, no problem. It's, if it's, that's meant to be God, no problem. Let's go to Zacharias in Old Testament, chapter 6, verse 5. There are four spirits. So are there seven gods now? Because the word in, uh, in Hebrew is ruach. And you wouldn't know about Hebrew because, look, I, I, I think not only do you not know Arabic, but you don't know Hebrew, and you're making a big mistake by trying to interpret the, the biblical text in this way. There's two words for spirits in the Hebrew language, ruach, which is the same as the Arabic, and the ruach. The word ruach is here in, uh, in Zechariah uh, ch chapter 6, verse 5, talking about four spirits. So tell us why. Uh, if that is a spirit and it's God, then how come there's only three gods, uh, uh, three persons of God, and, uh, and there isn't seven, for example? He says that, for, that Jesus, this is called the etymology fallacy. That's, you know, he's been referred to as Emmanuel, etc. God is with us. Elijah is also, the word Elijah in the, in the Hebrew language means God is with us. So if, if that makes Jesus God, then Elijah is also a God. We move on. What else did he say? I am statement. If you look at the New International Version of the Bible, uh, the I am is actually not re re translated as I am, but I will be. And there's a whole discussion on that. And to be honest with you, frankly, I don't even take the Gospel of John to be completely authoritative, and neither do the majority of biblical scholars anyways. 95 AD, it's a long way. He says, Allah says, uh, that Allah yusalli ala nabi and he's here saying that he prays to the Prophet. There's a difference between yusalli lahu and yusalli ala in the Arabic language. I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I knew I was going to have to give you a free Arabic lesson here today. <laughs> I knew it. And that's why the translators put for, not to the prophet. You don't know what the, the words in Arabic mean. Don't hear, speak salah. Come on, please, don't embarrass yourself. Allah has parts. He says Muslim scholars say we should take this literally. Which Muslim scholars? <laughs> Which Muslim scholars? Uh, he says, كُلُّ شَيْءٍ هَلِكْ إِلَّا وَجْهَا in Surah Al-Qasas, chapter 20 of the Quran, means everything is destroyed except for his face. And this means that Allah, all his body parts will be destroyed. He has body parts in these things. First of all, the word kull in Arabic doesn't necessarily mean all. As Subki wrote a book, Al-Kull wa Matadul. And he said, and he shows with examples, that the word kull doesn't mean all. I'll give you an example. In chapter 46 of the Quran, Surah Al-Ahqaf, تُدَمِّرُ كُلُّ شَيْءٍ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهَا فَأَصْبَحُ لَا يُرَى إِلَّا مَسَاكِنَهُمْ That the wind destroyed everything, kulli shay, the same words here in Surah Al-Qasas, everything was destroyed except for their houses. If it meant every single thing, it wouldn't have been their houses would not be there. So the word kul doesn't mean that in Arabic language. Once again, it's a problem with language. He says that, this is exactly his words, he said the Quran is eternal person. Tell me one scholar in the history of Islam who said that. This is a lie. He says, the Quran is uh, it, it, you have to, it will come as a shafi'ah on the day of judgment. So if, this is the question, I'll put it better for you, I'll help you, yeah? If the Quran is an attribute of God, how can it intercede for you? This is what he's saying, right? It's a good question, this is a good question. But it's not a proper understanding of the hadith. This is a, the only good question you had, I'll give it to you. This is the only good question you had. The, the hadith says, Iqra al-Quran. So it's not that the Qur'an, i.e. the attribute of Allah that will intercede for you on the Day of Judgment, but it is your qira'ah of the Qur'an and the thawab that you get of the Qur'an, which means the reward you get from the recitation of the Qur'an, not the Qur'an as an attribute of Allah. Yeah. <laughs> he says, therefore, there's 114 persons of the Qur'an, two kokwe fallacy, two kokwe fallacy, 
I told you he would do it and appeal to hypocrisy. So here are you admitting that having more than one person of a being of God is wrong because you should lead to Trinitarianism then. But obviously, as we know, there's no one in the history of Islam that referred to the surah of the Quran as persons. This is wrong. You don't know about Islam. Here you're being educated. He said, وَلَمْ تَكُنْ لَهُ صَاحِبَ He didn't know the Arabic, but I'm going to give him the, uh, the Arabic. In chapter 6, verse 108 of the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah did not have a mate. So does this mean, what does this mean? That uh, 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 biological, they had a discussion about biological. Really and truly, how can you have a begotten son? There's only three options. Number one, biology. Number two, adoption. And number three, metaphor. And if you say it's not biology and it's not adoption, it must be a metaphor. So Jesus is not a son of God. Okay. And then he says that the prophet, they, they played, you know, they tried to get his hair and the spit and these things. Okay. Well, if you think spitting on someone makes you a god, well, that's what it implies. And I wonder why you look at every other verse of the Bible as implying that Jesus was God. Because for you, a spit, that's, that's making me a god now. <laughs> I mean, don't embarrass yourself in front of me. Assalamu alaikum. He said this means that he's interceding because it's a narrative voice. Assalamu alaikum. We say this in the tashahud every time. It's a narrative voice. However, let's not say it's a narrative voice. Let's give it to him. He says this must mean that the Prophet Muhammad is omnipresent. Yes, he's omnipresent. Let's, let's have fun with him today. There is a hadith in Bukhari which says that whenever one person does salah on the Nabi, which means blessings and praise on the, the, the Prophet, blessings on the Prophet, the angel will carry that and give it to him. It doesn't mean that he's hearing it everywhere. The angel is moving it around. This is from the will of Allah. And if you didn't know that, now you do. He says that kalimatullah, that Isa being referred to as the word of Allah, must mean that he is divine. So uh, although the Quran says clearly that he's not divine, no, it makes a mistake, he is divine. Well, it, you're all over the place. You're fumbling all over the place. It's embarrassing. Kalimatullah is, is defined in chapter 3, verse 58 of the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna mathala Isa indallahi, indallahi Adam, khalaqahu min turabin, thumma qala lahu kun, fayakun. Five minutes left. He said to him, be, and he was. The word is defined in the Quran as be. So Allah says be, and things are. Just like he said be with Adam, he said be with Jesus, and he was. He says that there are seven uh, planetary things in Arabia and these things. I mean, how can you make a, a judgment? First of all, I haven't got a reference for that. I didn't see a reference. He didn't say, yes, I give you a reference here. It says Bukhari, whatever. Even if he's got a reference, how do you know that the practice originated from that and not from Abraham? After all, Abraham, even in the Old Testament, yes, he existed, pre-existed before Jesus, even though you have, uh, you know, the physical Jesus. And he was there in the desert. And you have in the book of Psalms mention of pilgrimage. So, if this is the case, then I wonder why uh, this is mentioned. Now, this is, I think this is all that he kind of mentioned. I want to give you one principle, ladies and gentlemen, that will destroy everything he said. The Quran says, chapter 42, verse 11, that there's nothing like him. You cannot do tashbih or tamthil of Allah. Anything that we see in the Quran, talking about the hand, talking about the face, all of these things, you can rest assured because of this verse and the other verse that this means, yes, this means it cannot be compared to anything you imagine. In the Quran, anyways, I mean every Muslim knows this, but the idea is there's an implicit admission here that I've lost. This is, this is what we come up with. I've lost. Yes, we know Trinitarianism is so confusing, but I'm going to show you how much, uh, you know, Tawhid is confusing as well. I have a, a admitted defeat, therefore I'm going down, I'm going down, I'm going to try and take you down with me. That's, that's really what you're trying to say to me, David Wood. I know by the look of your face here, you would probably agree with me, let's be honest, look at his face. Everyone, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> take a look at his face. Yes, anyways, I've got a few minutes left. Let me recite some Quran because I've done with this guy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says in chapter number 19, verse number 31, about Jesus, this is what we believe about Jesus. Allah 
وجعلني مباركا أينما كنت وأوصاني بالصلاة والزكاة ما دمت حيا وبرا بوالدتي ولم يجعلني جبارا شقيا والسلام علي يوم ولدت ويوم أموت ويوم أبعث حيا ذلك عيسى بن مريم قول الحق الذي فيه يمترون قول الحق الذي فيه يمترون ما كان لله أن يتخذ من ولدا سبحانه سبحانه إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون وإن الله ربي وربكم فاعبدوه هذا صراط مستقيم فاختلف الأحزاب من بينهم فويل للذين كفروا من مشهد يوم عظيم. The ISIS said Jesus, according to this is guys, Christians. This is what Allah says in the Quran. Listen to it. Tell me if this is not a better model for you. Be honest. This is Jesus. He says, I am the slave of Allah, of God. He gave me the book and he made me a prophet. Just like in chapter 8. Of Mark, verse one minute left. Yes, forty-eight. People thought Jesus was a prophet in in the Old Testament, in the New Testament time, in the time of Jesus when he was alive. And he made me blessed wherever I am. This is what we believe of Jesus. He made me blessed wherever I am. You know. And he told me to pray and to give charity so long as I am alive. You know. This is what we believe about Jesus Christ. I was good with my mother. I wasn't an arrogant person. And peace be upon me the day I was born, and the day I die, and the day I will come back to life. That is Jesus, son of Mary, the one who you differed about. Jazakumullahu khairan. Uh, before we start on uh, Dr. David Wood's uh, rebuttal, I'd just like to remind uh, our, our fellow audience, uh, verbal cheering is, please, please refrain from verbal cheering, clapping is sufficient enough, and we'd just like to remind both speakers to stay on topic and be respectful towards the other speaker. Thank you, and Dr. David Wood, you have the floor. Thank you again, Mohammed. Uh, in my opening statement, I laid out a basic case for the doctrine of the Trinity, and I claimed that the Islamic concept of God is a, more confusing than what we're normally told. Um, I pointed out that Allah prays, and he said, well, there's a difference in the meaning of the verb here. Well, the Quran says repeatedly that Allah prays, and guess what? He prays in the Hadiths as well. And what's interesting is there are even Muslim translators who are acknowledging this and translating these passages as Allah prays. So uh, Aisha Buley, I've got a ton of Islamic books translated by her, respected around the world. From Riyadh as salahin the Messenger of Allah said, Allah and his angels and the people of the heavens and the earth, even the ants in their rocks and the fish, pray for blessings on those who teach people good. So Allah prays. Who's he praying to? Al-Ahadith al-Qudsiyah, by, translated again by a Muslim translator. Hadith number 216, the Israelites said to Musa, does your Lord pray? Musa said, Fear Allah, O sons of Israel. Allah said, O Musa, what did your people say? Musa said, O my Lord, you already know. They said, Does your Lord pray? Allah said, Tell them, my prayer for my servants is that my mercy should precede my anger. If it were not so, I would have destroyed them. 
Allah prays that his mercy will triumph over his wrath. Now, if Allah is praying, what's, he's praying for self-control here, apparently, right? He wants to punish them, but he prays for self-control. This is not me. This is, these are your hadiths and your translators translating these passages as Allah praying. Why? Because that's what salah means. If I'm wrong, give me, give me the linguistic basis for, for saying otherwise. Second, I said that Allah has various parts, but only his face is imperishable, which means that different parts of Allah have different attributes. Um, that's just what it says. It says, everything will perish except his face. So if you're interpreting the parts as literal parts, We've just got a problem here, right? It gives the qualification. It's saying everything will perish. And I understand it can say, you know, everything this or everything that. It's saying that everything perishes except his face. It's drawing the only, the only exception there, which would mean that certain parts are parts with different attributes. Unless Allah is just not clear in his Quran, which he claims to be clear over and over again. Um, third, I said that the Quran is an eternal person. He's Allah's eternal word, but he also takes the form of a pale man. Now, um, it's kind of hard to hear because uh, over there, but I think um, Muhammad replied that it's your own recitation that appears to you. Now, that's interesting enough. Uh, if your own recitation of the Quran is, uh, is appearing as a pale man, um, but uh, I don't think that's what it means because of the next point, which is that individual chapters of the Quran appear as flocks of birds to intercede for you. So if individual chapters of the Quran are appearing and pleading for you, then why wouldn't the entire Quran as a whole also be appearing to you? So it seems that it's not just talking about your own uh, good recitation or something like that, but uh, the book itself. He says, I am the Quran. Um, now, by the way, this is a uh, very interesting, um, and I, I think it might be a, a source of problem here. Um, Muhammad says, well, who, who refers to these Quran chapters as persons? And I think there's a little difficulty here. This might be why he's uh, having trouble understanding the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, if, he's, if he's misunderstanding this word uh, person here and, and, and how it's applied. Um, if a flock of birds can talk and has knowledge, and this flock of birds knows what you've been doing, they know that you've been reciting the Quran, they intercede for you, they plead to Allah on your behalf, well, those are qualities of, of what we call a person in philosophy, right? It, it's communicating like that, it, it, has, it has certain kinds of knowledge, it, it uh, appeals to people in certain ways. This is what we mean by the term uh, person. And by the way, because we're talking about uh, origins of, of Islamic practices, if you um, go to the early Islamic history, um, there were goddesses, there were many people in Arabia who believed in, um, in, a, in a kind of hierarchy, right? Where they believed in Allah and they believed that Allah was the main deity, but they believed in lower deities and these were intercessors. Now, Alat, Alus, and Manat were three goddesses and they were called the exalted cranes. They were the birds that would carry your prayers to Allah, or they would fly up to Allah and intercede for you. Now, why is this interesting? Well, the goddesses are described in terms of birds who go and intercede for you. But Muhammad, after introducing Tawheed, says that it's actually chapters of the Quran that do that for you now. They appear as flocks of birds to go up to Allah and intercede for you. Now, if I asked any Muslim in here, hey, if someone believes that there's God and then there are these other beings who uh, intercede and fly up to him and, inter and, and intercede for you and plead for you, is that polytheism or monotheism? Every Muslim would say that's polytheism. Okay, well, if there are these flocks of birds around and they are the eternal speech of Allah and they fly up and intercede for you and they plead on your behalf, what is that? It's pure monotheism. That is very interesting. He says no one refers to uh, the Quran as a uh, person or, or chapters of the Quran as, as, as a person. Again, if you understand uh, uh, how we use the term, uh, that should end the confusion. Um, as for the Quran, having a mother, Um al-Khattab. Now, he pointed out that 
Well, if you're, if you're saying it's not literally biological, then you must be saying it's, it's merely metaphorical. And no, not in the Jewish or Christian scriptures. Son of is used in a variety of ways. And so the appropriate, Five response, minutes left. The appropriate response to Christian theology would be explain to, you, explain to us what Jesus' sonship means, and that would be explained in terms of the doctrine of the Trinity, but no Christian has ever meant that Jesus is the biological son of the Father. So if Allah is telling Muslims in the Quran, and I bring this up because I hear this from Muslims almost every day, well, how can you believe that God had sex with Mary? Well, I've never heard of a Christian believing that. Where are you getting that idea from? Getting it from the Quran, from Allah. So the point here is, if Allah knows what the Christian doctrine is, why doesn't Allah say what the Christian doctrine is and then explain why it's wrong? He just never does. Allah tries to refute the Trinity, doesn't know what the doctrine of the Trinity is. He thinks it's, it's Allah, Jesus, and Mary, who are three separate beings who just work together. That's not the doctrine of the Trinity. What's he responding to? Likewise, with the sonship of Jesus, he gets it all wrong. So you've got a problem here. Either your God doesn't know what we believe, in which case he lacks knowledge, or he does know what we believe and he's deliberately making fun of it or misrepresenting it. If he's deliberately mis misrepresenting it, then that would be an ethical problem. Um, six, I said that Allah's spirit is an eternal person who takes the form of a man to carry out tasks. Um, Again, having trouble hearing down there. If there was a response to that, please remind me. Seventh, I said that Islam deifies Muhammad. Uh, said, well, you know, Muhammad spitting and stuff doesn't, but what's that got to do with him being God? That's not, that's not the point. The point was, Muhammad's just a man. The Muhammad's just a man. Muhammad's just a man. And then you see how his followers acted towards him, and it's clear he was much more than a man to him. When a normal human being is walking down the street and spits, you don't say, ooh, I have to rub this all over my body. Muhammad's companions did. If a hair falls off a normal human being's head, you don't say, ooh, I need to grab this. I need to save this. If someone is bleeding, a normal human being is bleeding, you don't say, hey, let me get that running blood and drink it. This was acceptable behavior from Muhammad and his followers. And how, if you saw anyone doing this, if I said, hey, there's this place somewhere in South America or something, and they've got this guy down there, and whenever he spits, they rub it on their faces. Whenever he washes himself, they collect the water so they can rub it on themselves. Whenever he bleeds, he gets cut, they drink it. You say, ah, oh, look at this idolatry. Look at this paganism. But that's exactly how Muhammad expected his followers to act. And for some reason, whenever it's in Islam, it's still just pure monotheism. I said that Islam accidentally deifies Jesus, calls Jesus Allah's word and a spirit from Allah. Now keep in mind, those are the two eternal, co-creating, co-eternal beings with Allah, his word and his spirit. Now this is interesting. Muhammad said, Muhammad Hijab said that the Quran calls Jesus the word because Allah said be, and he was. So Allah said be, and he was, and this makes him Allah's word. Now that's very interesting because uh, according to chapter 16, verse 40 of the Quran, that's how Allah creates everything. That's how Allah creates me. So Allah created me by saying be, and according to Muhammad Hijab, that's how you can identify someone as the word of Allah. What's that make me? I am the word of Allah, according to Muhammad Hijab. So. If you reject anything I One say, minute left. if you reject anything I say for the rest of the evening, you're guilty of rebelling against Allah's word. As far as Islam drawing its uh, worship from um, its basic practices from the pagans of Mecca, there's really no dispute. You, you can read in the Muslim sources that the pagans are, are walking these circles and kissing the black stone and so on. Uh, you can also read that they believed in these seven planetary deities that are circling the earth. So you can read all about their worship. What you have to believe if you want to reconcile this with Islam is you have to say Abraham set that up walking the seven circles and then the pagans misinterpreted it at some point and they started walking seven circles around 
the Kaaba for a completely different reason. Um, so you'd have to believe that. And then as far as the black stone, well, it was a black stone and then it became part of their pagan worship and then got brought back. But keep in mind, this is Five seconds. a rock that is going to appear with eyes and a mouth and you kiss it. Thank you very much, Dr. David Wood. Now we're going to enter into our second phase of rebuttals, which each speaker will have eight minutes each. Uh, you can go ahead, Doc, uh, Mr. Muhammad Hijab. He mentioned again this issue of Salah Ali, Allah. And I've told you the difference. I don't know why I kept repeating it. He says person, I'm going to try and do this in three minutes, yeah? He says person, uh, this, this shows you that the Suwar upper, he thinks, he says, he thinks this means that the chapters of the Quran are persons. I wanna, I've always wanted to do this, yeah? To take a word from Dwayne, the, the Rock Johnson. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> I mean, flock of birds and the, the man who comes, the pale man. Yes, this is in good deeds. And this proves my point, once again, that the Qira'ah of the Quran is what is represented, the, the thawab. You get the rewards for doing the good. And it comes. That's what the hadith is talking about. The man comes in a, in a good form. This is the hadith in Bukhari. He says, Allah comes birds. Uh, intercession means polytheism. Well, من ذا الذي يشفع عن دوان إلا بإذني Chapter 2, verse 255 of the Quran. Who will intercede with God except with his permission? It's one part of a verse which refutes all of your claims about intercession, in fact. Uh, he says, um means mother. It doesn't only mean mother. Don't tell me about Arabic language. You ask me about Arabic language in this, in this forum. You ask me. You don't tell me. You ask, Muhammad, what does the word um mean? You don't tell me um means this. No, I tell you. It means mother, yes. It doesn't only mean mother. We say um al-kutub. The, 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 the main books. It means something foundational. Um al-Quran. The Quran says, the main cities. Come on, man. Don't waste my time with this. He says... Salah, he said, he actually asked me for something linguistic. He said, what's the linguistic basis that the, the word Salah, what, is it, what does it come from? Etymologically, the word Salah comes from the word Sila. Sila means connection. So it can be any connection. It doesn't necessarily always have to be prayer. And the word actually Salah means Dua. Yes, this is the root word. But it comes from the etymological root word Sila, which means connection. It could mean any connection. Sila to Raham, for example. Connecting with your family members. You don't know these things. He says the Quran gets the Trinity wrong. And he's talking about chapter 5, verse 116 of the Quran, where it talks about, did you tell your mother that you can take two of us as, as lords beside God? It's not talking about the Trinity in this verse. Where does it say this is the Trinity and then uh, describe it? The only the verses that describe the Trinity, for example, chapter 4, verse 171 of the Quran, other places of the Quran, like chapter 5 where the brother was reading, it never tells you what the Trinity is, which is why, for example, many scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah and his Jabba Sahih, many scholars actually did say that the Trinity was the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But some scholars differed with them in exegesis. It doesn't matter. The word three in Arabic, thalatha, means all of the kinds of trinities that all of the Christians have ever believed in in all of history. So the word thalatha in Arabic is all comprehensive. It doesn't say that the, the word trinity is Mary. It doesn't say that in the Quran. You have lied against the Quran. And then he says here, the ruh, the ruh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this, you have to understand basic, basic rules of grammar of Arabic. Yadafa, naqat Allah. Naqat Allah means the camel of Allah. Is, is that another person? I will help you, I will help you. Yadafa me, means... Actually, I'm not going to go into it, to be honest with you. Idafa is a, go to a, a basic Arabic uh, uh, you know, textbook. What is mudaf? Mudaf is the first thing the Arab students learn. Let's not waste my time with this, please. You've come here, 20 years of research, and this is what you pre present. Don't waste my time. It says here, Islam accidentally deifies Jesus because he is a kalimatullah. Why does the Quran call him the kalima? Because it's stressing the fact that Allah said be and he was to make it an emphasis, a point of emphasis for Christians who believe otherwise. And then the pagans, uh, pagan sources, he didn't give any. Now, realize, ladies and gentlemen, this man put Christianity under the bus. He threw Christianity under the bus today. I asked him four questions. None of those questions were answered. None of those questions were answered. I asked Four minutes him, left. where is the Trinity in 300 years if it is a basic, natural inference of the Old Testament? How could you have 4,000 years of Hebrew history? No one has inferred it. If it's a natural reading of the New Testament, how comes you have 300 years? 300 years. 
And no church father believed in Nicene Trinitarianism the way that you believe today. Why are you back projecting, anachronistically superimposing this idea that was advanced and crystallized by the Cappadocian fathers in 381 and putting it and forcing it, you're the one forcing it, forcing it on the New Testament. More egregiously, you're forcing it in the Old Testament. You have, put, you have done a shameful service today for the, for the Christians. You have not defended Christianity today. You should have brought James White with you or someone like that. Seriously, you should have brought someone who could have helped you. You were saying me and Adnan and Ali versus you. Man, you should have brought someone with you. Seriously. What's going on here? 20 years of attacking Islam. 20 years of attacking Islam. 99% of your content is anti-Islam. And all of those things you brought today were dismissed in four minutes. You couldn't handle the questioning. I gave you four. I gave you four questions. I did the service, sir, of answering all of your questions. You didn't even answer one of mine. How dare you? How dare you? What is this? Seriously. And the reason why, once again, I apologize to all the other Christians here. Why? This man has made mockumentaries against Islam. He's attacked Muslims, aggravated Muslims. We know his story. He's not any regular Christian, ladies and gentlemen. The Quran says, Laysu sawa'a. The Christians are not all the same. If it was James White, I would have shown him the utmost respect. If it was William Lane Craig, I would have shown him the utmost respect. If it was any of those guys, I would have shown them the utmost respect. But this man, no, no, no. No, no, no. Read the Bible. I will teach you the Bible today. Mr. Pick Hijab, please stay on topic. Okay, no problem. <laughs> I've got two, um, one minute and a half. And I've, I'm pretty much done. I can't believe it. <laughs> Should I give it as a charity to him? I'll give it as a charity to you. Have a minute and a half charity from a Muslim to you. Go ahead. Starting our second rebuttal, eight minutes. Dr. David Wood, you may start. Oh, that's nine and a half. He said I, I got it as, as charity. Thank you, thank you. I take, I take all the charity. All right, well, I guess we'll start off with the four questions. I, always, I knew we had more rebuttal time, and I didn't think they were too terribly difficult to, uh, to answer, so let's go through them. Question number one, why isn't the Trinity mentioned in the Old Testament? Well, I, I pointed out multiple passages, multiple passages where you find a plurality, and the question is why you have this plurality if... It's just this pure monotheism that Muslims believe in. I quoted Isaiah, chapter 48, verse 16, where Yahweh is speaking, and Yahweh says that he has been sent by Yahweh along with the spirit of Yahweh. How do you make sense of that? Now, to be clear, that is not, that is not a clear statement of the doctrine of the Trinity. But to say that these passages refute the doctrine of the Trinity, that the Old Testament refutes the doctrine of the Trinity. Wait a minute, we'll keep this time. Even the go-to verse, right? you have lots of verses that sound like plurality. You have to interpret those away if you don't want to believe that the Old Testament is actually calling for saying that God is plural in some sense. But even the go-to passage, the Shema, which he said it, in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that's the go-to verse. That's the go-to verse that proves this pure monotheism. You know what the, the Shema actually says? Shema Yisrael Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Now, we insert extra words in there to make that a complete sentence. What that actually says, hear, O Israel, Yahweh, it's the name of God, Eloheinu means our God, Yahweh means our, that's God, one. That's what it says. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, Eloheinu, Yahweh, one. That's what it says names God three times, and then says one. Now, this is a Jewish commentary 
on the Torah. I wanted to quote this because there's a commentary on the Shema itself. They're commenting and they say, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh is one. These three are one. How can the three names be one? Only through the perception of faith in the vision of the Holy Spirit and the beholding of the hidden eyes alone. Now, that, by the way, these are Unitarians here. But the fact that they're discussing a kind of tri-unity in the go-to passage for Muslims around the world to say, this refutes the doctrine of the Trinity, and they're describing it in Trinitarian terms, again, not the Christian Trinity, but tri-unity of the names there, if that's your best, you're going to need something better. So you find plurality throughout the Old Testament in various passages. Why doesn't, the, why doesn't God specifically say Trinity? Well, I think it's very similar to um, what you find when Moses comes along and God says to him, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew me, but they did not know me as Yahweh. Now, this isn't just talking about the name. It's talking about God's character. So think about this. God is bringing a covenant. God is bringing a covenant to the children of Israel with Moses. And then he says, I'm revealing more about myself than I did to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now think about this. According to Muhammad Ajab, we'd have to say, ah, oh, well, why didn't they know this earlier stuff then? Why didn't they have the same knowledge? Well, Christians and Muslims believe in progressive revelation. God can give more. Now think about what God did there. He's giving a covenant, a new covenant. Back then, we call it the old covenant now, but back then it was a new covenant. He's giving a new covenant, and he says, I'm giving you a new covenant, and I'm going to reveal more about myself to you. So according to the Old Testament, what does God do when he brings a new covenant? Well, the pattern is he gives them a deeper understanding of who he is. So why doesn't the Trinity just clearly define, I mean, why doesn't the Old Testament clearly define the doctrine of the Trinity? Well, in the Old Testament as well, Jeremiah chapter 31, a new covenant is coming. It's prophesied in the future. The big one is coming. The big covenant is coming. Well, don't you think God's got some more information in store for the people of the new covenant when this new covenant comes? I do. And who brings the new covenant? Well, Jesus. It's Jesus entering the world and then the Holy Spirit being poured out where we find out about the inner life of God. And this is correlated with God's plan of salvation. Four minutes left. So, why isn't it clearly mentioned? Well, that, that's how God works, he, progressive revelation. He does this throughout the Bible. He keeps giving them more and more information, especially when he's giving a new covenant. Muhammad Hijab says, well, why didn't the church fathers from the second, third century and so on give fourth century descriptions of the doctrine of the Trinity? Now think about this. In the first century, the books of the Bible are passed out and they're they're sort of individual books. They're, they're, there's not a collection yet. So, in the first century, you've still got books circulating as individual books. By the second century, they start getting collected. But think about who Christians are. They're, they're, you've got farmers, you've got fishermen, and so on. You don't have, this early on, this professional class of theologians. That builds up over time. And for the first three centuries, Christians are, and Christianity is an illegal religion and persecuted. They can't get together for big conferences to do stuff and to, um, and, to, and to have discussions like this. The first time they're able to get together and have these big, these big councils is in the fourth century, and that's what they do. And it gets ironed out very quickly. So the problem as far as what's revealed to the Christians they have revelations about the Father, about the Son, about the Spirit. These things are given to them. One, they need the tools of exegesis for saying, this is what the Holy Spirit did. This is what Jesus did. How do we understand the eternal nature of God based on this? Well, that's kind of difficult work to do, ladies and gentlemen. It's kind of difficult work to do. So that sort of thing takes a while. And they don't have the terminology. How are you describing God being one in essence or nature uh, and three in person? 
They don't have a, they don't even know what language to apply to the eternal God. They eventually settle on some, but that takes time. But throughout this, Father is God, Holy Spirit is God, Son is God. This is revealed in scripture. If every church father in the history of the world had gotten it wrong, that wouldn't change what the Bible teaches. And, and by the way, just imagine if, if we're going to be discussing uh, the nature of the Quran or something like this, and I say, oh, you know, we got Sunnis and Shias and, and uh, these earlier heretical groups, and everyone's getting stuff wrong and so on. Well, Islam should be defined by the, the Islamic sources and the teachings that you could draw from them, just like Christianity should be defined by Christian sources. Question three was, who says that the Holy Spirit is co-equal and co-eternal? Which part of he's God don't you understand? Right? If the Holy Spirit is God, they say, ah, oh, where do you say co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, like later creeds say? Where does it say, where did they say that earlier? One minute left. He's God. If I say the Holy Spirit has the attributes of God, you can ask, well, what about all these later distinctions that became very important to them later on when they're dealing with various kinds of heresies? They come up with the terms to respond to the heresy, but all of these are based on going back to the scriptures and seeing what lines up with them. And finally, how can we reconcile the contradiction of the Trinity? Um, I don't know what you mean by contradiction. Uh, contradiction is saying that a statement is both true and false at the same time in the same sense. Um, no Christian says that God is one and three in the same sense. Never met a Christian who said that. We say that God is one in essence or being or nature and three in person. And if you say that's false, well, I mean, think, even Islam believes that God is one in one Ten way, seconds. more than one in another way. God is one on the level of being, more than one on the level of attribute. His mercy triumphs over his wrath. You don't say that's another God. Why? Because that's the level of attribute. Well, we have the level of person. Dr. Rudy, your time is up. Does he have any That's it, right? Crossfire, right? Uh, Mr. Hajab, yeah. uh, if you want to stay seated for the crossfire, that's... Oh, is there no conclusions? No we're, conclusions? We're actually about to do the crossfire. Oh, okay. okay. Questions first. Uh, so you can go ahead and uh, ask the first question uh, to Dr. David Wood, and he will have two minutes to respond. Well, let's, let's start with the questions you did not answer. Which church father for the first 300 years explicitly mentioned that the Holy Spirit is co-equal, co-eternal with God? Go ahead, Dr. Wood. Again, from the Bible on, the Holy Spirit is God. Now, here's what I don't understand. If you take someone like Tertullian or something like this and say, who calls the Holy Spirit God, and the question then becomes, well, when did he say he's co-equal or co-eternal? What do you think God, what do you think these guys mean when they say the Holy Spirit is God? What do you think the Bible means? The Bible calls him eternal. What do you mean co-eternal? If he's eternal, then he's obviously co-eternal with the Father. So I'm not under, it's like, it's like saying, if I tell you I am the current president of the United States, and you say, aha, but where, where are you claiming to be Donald Trump? Well, if I claim to be the current president of the United States, I would be claiming to be Donald Trump, right? I don't have to say that other thing, right? So if you say so-and-so is God or so-and-so has the attributes of God, it just, doesn't make, it just doesn't make sense to say, well, where is he co-equal with the Father or co-this? Co these are, One minute these are terms, these are terms, this is language that was used in later councils to clarify to clarify. I mean, I could turn right around and say, where does the Quran say that the Quran is eternal? Well, that's a conclusion you draw, right? That's a conclusion you draw from various things that the Quran says. It doesn't say that, right? You have to interpret it that way. I don't understand why you can say, okay, well, the Bible says that the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Son is God, and therefore, as far as, the essence, the, as, far as their essence, they're all God, they're all Yahweh, and therefore, in that sense, they are co-equal. So what you have is later church fathers saying, okay, if they all share the same essence, then in that sense, they're co-equal. Why, why would you expect someone in the first century to use a word that came about to clarify something in the fourth century? I don't know. Thank you very much, Dr. Wood. You may ask your first question towards Mr. Hajab. Uh, yes, uh, going back to 
a lot praying because I'm not just trying to mess with you guys here. I'm really, I'm really confused, right? Um, because, as I pointed out, you have Muslim translators translating passages in the Hadith saying that Allah and his creation praise. And you look at the Quran, and it's using similar word, but this is different. This is the Quran. And you know it's multiple passages. And then Muslim translators are translating it as praise. And then you have, I think it's Termidi, which, which uh, use it. And it, it won't translate it as anything. It just says Allah performs his salat. Right? They won't say what it means because if you say it means praise, then you're, you're going to be confused. And if you translate it as something else, well, it, you're, then you're going to have to nail down a definition of the word. So what should this word mean? What should this, in the, in the Quran and the Hadith, how should this be translated? And why are even Muslim translators now translating it as praise if there's this clear other meaning? I have two minutes. I don't think I need two minutes, to be honest with you. I think I've dealt with that extensively. Um, the word salah, salli ala, is different from salli la. And there's, these are huruf jar. Basically, these are certain propositional uh, words that come after the verb. And depending on which of those words come, it differentiates the meaning completely. So because it says salla ala, and you'll never find anywhere in the Quran where it says li, for example, after the word salah, in respect of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Linguists and Muslims uh, clearly conclude that um, it means blessings, etc. Now, obviously, just looking at the Quran on a cursory level, if you read it in English, the translations of the meanings, you will find that there are certain verses of the Quran. If you are just, if you respect your intellect, you will see that it does not tell you to pray to Prophet Muhammad. Does not because it tells you only La ilaha illallah. The Quran says La ilaha illahu, only God is worthy of worship. You know, these things. So, one minute left. I appreciate that you've come a bit more humble this time. And you said, I'm confused. I hope, I hope you have understood this now. And if you don't, I think you should blame your intellect and your lack of knowledge. That's, that's, that's the state it should be right now. But just to, just to kind of touch upon what you said, because I do have a bit of time about Tertullian. He was a subordinationist. Tertullian was a subordinationist. He died 240. I don't actually think you read his works. I don't believe you've read his works. His primary source materials all stipulate he does use the language of the fourth century men, but he does not use it in the context of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so therefore, I conclude that Tertullian was a... And that's why he's deemed as a heretic by the Catholics he's, and, and by the Protestants. He's deemed and other people are deemed as heretics. So it's a back projection based on later developments of the church. And this is something you could not deal with, basically, in this... Uh, Ten seconds. In, in, the, in, this particular, uh, ..in this particular debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Hijab. You may go on forward with your second question. Right. So you you spoke about the attributes of um, you spoke about the attributes of the Holy Spirit, etc. I'm I'm just going to give you one example. I mean, this is a very easy question. In Mark chapter 13, verse 32, it says, "Only the Father knows when the hour is." Now, I understand why the Son might not know because it's the human side. You see, it's the human side. So he, you know, the, the God side might know, but the human. But what about the Holy Spirit? Why does the Holy Spirit not know when the hour is? We have two minutes, Dr. Wood. Well, the Holy Spirit is included. Uh, we have elsewhere that. The Holy Spirit searches the mind of God and knows everything that God knows. Um, if you look at what Jesus is doing there, when he says, um, when he says no one, he's referring to the level of human beings. By the way, if you, if you guys like that verse, that's, uh, if you believe Jesus said that, then Islam is false. Because notice you've got father and son there. According to the Quran, Allah is a father to no one. The highest relationship you can have with Allah is a slave to master relationship. So um, if you believe that, then Islam is false. Um, but if you look what he says there, already he sets up a hierarchy. He says, the day of the time, he says, no one knows, referring to the level of men. And then he says, not even the angels. So that's the entire created order. No man knows, not even the angels, not even the son, only the father. So even in this verse you're quoting, he's putting himself. One minute left. He's putting himself above all of creation. He's putting himself above all of creation. And so the question is, why, wouldn't, why would Jesus say that he doesn't know the hour? Well, there's, there's a long explanation, um, which I'm not even sure is correct. Uh, but usually we would, we would explain this in terms of... <laughs> 
Give me the easier one here. Hey, you're interfering with my time here. The straightforward one um, is Christians also believe in the kenosis when Jesus takes on human nature. You find this in John 1. Uh, and uh, what Muhammad mentioned earlier, um, the, the uh, hymn to Christ in Philippians where it says, he was in the form of God, but he made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant. We believe he actually took on the nature of a Ten servant seconds. and limited himself in that way. If you believe it's a problem, by the way, I mean, think about it. The Quran doesn't contain verses that the eternal Quran has, and yet you still believe you have the Quran, even though certain things have been withheld from you. So, Thank you very much, Dr. Wood. Uh, you can start your second question right now. Uh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm confused by mm -hmm. this uh, claim which you made earlier that, that Jews, um, Jews have regarded the doctrine of the Trinity as polytheism. I mean, Jews never saw any plurality uh, in the Old Testament. That's simply false. Um, before the end of the second century AD, it was very widespread to see a plurality within the one God. Um, this is from Benjamin Summer uh, from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, who writes, no Jew sensitive to Judaism's own classical sources can fault the theological model Christianity employs when it avows belief in a God who has an earthly body as well as a Holy Spirit and a heavenly manifestation. For that model, we have seen, is a perfectly Jewish one. A religion whose scripture contains the fluidity, traditions, whose teachings emphasize the multiplicity of the Shekinah, and whose thinkers speak of the Sephirot, does not differ in its theological essentials from a religion. Is this a question or is it a, uh, sorry, is yeah, this a question or what yeah, is it's, this? it's a question. So if Jewish scholars who are acknowledging that uh, the turn to uh, Unitarianism only arose in the second century as a reaction to Christianity to set themselves against the Christians more, um, how can you say that Jews never saw this when it's widely understood that they did? Okay. We have two minutes. Thank you for that question. He talks about in the last part of his speech the Shema and how it can mean three gods. Now he's speaking about, he spoke about three minutes about Prophet Muhammad spitting. I believe, believe you me, I, I think that genuinely speaking, if you, saw, if you gave your exegetical interpretation to a rabbi, I think he would spit at you. Um, because I don't think anybody of the Jewish, in, in 4,000 years of Hebrew history, has ever uh, believed in, in what you say that they believed. Give me one primary source of any Jew that believed in the Trinity. One pri Don't give me Benjamin Summers. He's, he's a secondary source material. You're meant to come here with academic uh, information at hand. I've only, I've only mostly quoted you primary source materials. You're an academic. You understand how it works in academia. Give me a primary source material of a Jew who believed three co-equal, co-eternal, independent beings. You will never, or persons of, a, of one God, you will never find this. One minute left. Okay, in that minute, well, <laughs> since, 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 to be honest with you, I mean, it was pretty easy to answer his, his question. Actually, I'll give it to him, man. I don't need to. I'll give it to him. I'll give it to him. Is it my turn to ask? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. I'll give you a primary source material. Justin Marta was a, um, was a church father, as you know, who was very early, I think he died 110 or something like that, AD, and he wrote a book called The First Apologies. In chapter 21 of this book, Justin Marta was having a conversation with a pagan, okay? And he said to the person, the pagan, he said to him that just as you believe that Jupiter is God and there are sons of Jupiter, we believe that the Father is God and Jesus is the Son of God. My question to you is this. How can you assure us today that in the first 300 years of Christian history, that there has not been a Greek mythological influence in the formulation of the Trinity. You have two minutes, Dr. Wood. Well, um, we, we have first century documents, right? Um, 
with the, the possible exception of, of Luke, they're all devout Jews. They had utter contempt for the religions of the pagans, of the polytheists. Um, the scriptures that they appealed to are the Old Testament. These guys were thoroughly Jewish. They appealed to Old Testament prophecies. They are devout monotheists. Um, the, the views they came to have about Jesus and the Holy Spirit came from Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They didn't go up to Europe and get something about Zeus or something like that. Um, so we know where their beliefs came from, right? The, Jesus comes in the world, Jesus makes all kinds of claims. Um, these guys, many of these uh, early Christians went to their horrible bloody deaths proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. One minute left. If they were just sort of trying to compromise or picking up something they heard uh, in, in the market, um, they, they wouldn't have to deal with that sort of thing. Um, as for, as for, for Justin Martyr, now Justin, everyone acknowledges that Justin Martyr makes a bad comparison, but he's actually appealing to the Roman leaders to stop persecuting Christians. He's, he's making a plea here. Stop, stop killing us, stop the persecutions, please. We're begging you. And in this, it's, well, you know, we believe Jesus is the Son of God. You believe in sons of God, so why, why are you guys out here? Why are you, why are you guys out here persecuting us? Um, you can't draw a tremendous amount uh, of that about our uh, theology coming from them, especially when you have Old Testament passages Ten about the Son, the Messiah, uh, and the Messiah being the Son, and the Son being the mighty God. Thank you very much, Dr. Wood. You may ask your third question. Yes. Um, Tawheed. Um, mm -hmm. When we look at all the things we have here, we have the uh, eternal word of Allah, which is co-eternal, and so he's got his co-eternal word with him. Uh, we've got a spirit. We've got all of these different things going on. And then you have the word Tawheed to describe it, which doesn't simply mean oneness, as I understand it. So, I did. so since you're uh, talking about the Arabic here, um, as I understand it comes from Wahada, which means to unify, and therefore Tawheed means the unification. But if you're unifying something, then you're bringing different things together. And so if we look and we see you know, these flocks of birds taking the place of the pagan goddesses and uh, interceding for you and things like that, um, could this word Tawheed mean something beyond oneness here when we see all of these different things. If, if Allah is trying to avoid anything but Tawheed and you've got all of these different things and things that are co-eternal with him and interceding flocks of birds, uh, how do we reconcile all this? Okay, thank you. Um, tawheed is a, what you call a mustar in the Arabic language. Yes, you're right to say it comes from the Arabic word wahada, uh, which means unifying something, and it could mean different things in different contexts, for sure. Now, the Quran, let's look at what the Quran actually says. The Quran says, Qul huwa Allahu. One more time. One more time. Thank you. One more time. One more time. <laughs> okay, okay. Ahad, in Arabic language, means the one and only. Yes? There was, there's a difference between wahid and ahad. Wahid could mean something which is cardinally counted. There's cardinal numbers. One, the first, second, third, yes? Wahid, yeah, but ahad can never be. So it means one and only. That's what the Quran says in one of the smallest chapters. Um, when you say that the, the, the Quran... One minute left. The Quran, this is, this is a mushaf, okay? These are pages, and this, this is, these are pages, right? We don't believe these pages and this ink is co-eternal. We don't believe that. Do you, do, you understand, do you understand what I'm saying? These pages and this ink, this, this is not, we don't believe, Muslims have never said, no Muslim has ever said in history that this is co-eternal. It's never there. Not even the Mu'tazil have said this, by the way. From uh, Wasil ibn Atta, died 133 AD, uh, AH. So no one has said that. What we believe is that the kalam of Allah, which is the words of Allah, are an attribute of God, Without tamthil or tashbih, we don't, make, we don't uh, liken it. And that the Qur'an spoken from Allah is a subset of that attribute. 
That's our belief. Not this physical thing here that you see, the papers Ten and seconds. things. We don't believe in that. Thank you very much, Mr. Hajab. Before Mr. Hajab starts his fourth question, just a friendly reminder, uh, please turn your cell phones off or keep it on silent so it won't distract the speakers. Thank you very much. You may go ahead, Mr. Hajab. Thank you very much. The question I have is, um, looking at a lot of your content online in the past week or two, I found that seemingly, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, yeah? You seem to make a moral case for uh, Christianity and a moral case against Islam. I watched one of your videos with someone called Ali Atai, I think his name was, and he, he made the point, he, he asked you a question, it's on the record. He said, if Jesus, and this is what we've been talking about today, uh, is the author of the Old Testament, if Jesus is the author of the Old Testament, how can you explain all of the things which you deem as immoral? Because as a, div a divine command theorist, I would expect you to believe that all of the things in the Old Testament, in terms of injunctions, if they had been made by Jesus, who is meant to be the author of the Old Testament, God, the triune God, would have been good. But you actually said it's bad. There are lots of bad, this, these are your words, there are lots of bad things in the Old Testament. Now, if, if Jesus is God, and he's the author, author of the Old Testament, and he has bad injunctions, how can you reconcile the fact that God, a maximally perfect good being, could give us bad injunctions? Dr. Rudy, I have two minutes. Yeah, I don't recall saying uh, bad things. I'll have to take a look at the clip. Um, I did acknowledge that there are all, I said there are all sorts of things in the, uh, in the Bible that bother me. I do, I do recall saying that. And what I mean by that is, I'm a philosopher, I'm a former atheist, when, and this would go for the Quran as well, when, when you know, things that, t passages talking about hell or something like that, eternal torment or uh, warfare or something like that, well, those things bother me. That doesn't mean I reject that they're from God. I say, okay, those are, th I, I've noticed a mindset in Islam that if you accept Islam, you, you can never really think critically about it. And I, I I, I, can't, I can't be like that. So uh, always, I'm always wrestling with issues, um, Old Testament and New Testament, um, and with the Quran as well. So as far as, as, far as the, the, the moral case, if we're talking about uh, Old Testament passages, looking at those things, yeah, I would say these things are, these things, ah, they're, you know, the-, the uh, One minute left. Entering the land of Canaan and fighting the Canaanites and so on, those things, those things, uh, they make me wonder sometimes, but, um, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to say, okay, if Jesus rose from the dead, then if I'm going to listen to anyone tell me about God, I'm going to listen to Jesus. And so if he's Lord, then, hey, if something bothers me, that's my problem, right? That's, that's my problem. That's something I have to wrestle with. God accepts that we have to wrestle with things. The Psalms are filled with people really, really wondering why certain things are happening. And uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. And I don't think God thinks it's a bad thing uh, when we look at something and go, oh, that's really rough. Now I really want to really think about that. So I don't see that as any big problem if something bothers me, but I'm convinced that I have good reasons to believe in Christianity, then Ten seconds. I don't really see the problem. Uh, and that's why I would still accept it because Jesus rose from the dead. Thank you, Dr. Wood. You may ask your fourth question. Yes, in the hadith, I'm, I'm wondering, um, because when Allah says, however you want to translate it, he says, uh, he prays and the angels pray, therefore you pray. It's like he's setting himself up as a model. So however you want to translate that, that's not the point. I'm not talking about that. Um, but he's setting himself up as a kind of model for behavior. But in hadith, we read Muhammad saying that uh, if you swear by so anything. which hadith? Yeah, that's a question. Yeah, yeah. If you swear by anything other than Allah, mm -hmm you're committing shirk and setting it up as a partner with Allah. So if Muhammad says that swearing by anything is committing shirk, and in the Quran, Allah swears by literally everything. He swears by all kinds of things, and then says he swears by the seen and the unseen. <laughs> then if Muhammad says doing this is shirk, and Allah then does it with literally everything, uh, doesn't this sound more like pantheism than if everything is set up with a part, with, as a partner with Allah. So it, it, it's mainly about what sort of things Allah has to do when Muhammad lays down rules like that. We have two minutes, Mr. Hajab. Thank you. Uh, 
shirk by definition can only be done by other than Allah. By definition. Because shirk, it means associating partners with Allah. <laughs> you can't, that's what, that's what shirk is, associating partners with Allah. So Allah can not, it's not within Allah's attributes to do shirk. It's not possible. That's not a possibility, right? So the question that you ask is about uh, how comes Allah, لا أقسم بهذا البلد, لا أقسم بهذا, all these things, والفجر and all this. He makes uh, what you call qasam. He does oaths in the Quran. Well, Allah even does an oath by himself. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ So the point is, why does Allah have the ability to do, to make an oath with anything he wants? And we can only make an oath with Allah because Allah owns everything. One and, minute left. And to Allah we belong. This is the reality. Yeah, so, and the scholars say, and the scholars say, whatever Allah makes an oath of, that becomes what you call mu'adham shara'an. It becomes an important thing in the sharia. Okay? Now, really and truly, just to, because some Muslims might be confused with, is it true that if someone does a qasam with other than Allah that they've committed major shirk? This is not the view of the majority of scholars, right? So they say that this is a minor kind of shirk, just for the uh, fiqhi thing. Don't make takfir of your friends that are saying, oh, oh, my mom's life, yes? Don't do an excommunication of them. Um, so that hopefully answers uh, your question. Thank you, Mr. Hajjad. You may ask your fifth question. Oh, yes. This was really interesting. It's a follow-up from what you said before. Because it seems to me that it was not a satisfactory answer. You were saying that you were wrestling with, with these things in the Bible, wrestling, grappling in your mind about these things in the Bible, in the Old Testament. You seem to think that morality, yes, can be achieved. You're a philosopher, yes? Can be achieved from other than an objective morality. This is your suggestion, that an objective morality can be achieved from other than the objective law. So I want to understand, as a, are you a divine command theorist? Do you believe that the injunctions of God must be perfect? And if, if you do believe this, how can you explain, and you did say bad, it can easily be <laughs> retrieved on the internet. I listened to it just yesterday. You said the, the, the Old Testament has bad things in it. You said this, yes? How can you explain that a maximally perfect, good God at one point and time put forward injunctions which could be bad or which otherwise bother you. Can you explain? You have two minutes, Dr. Wood. Oh, well, I mean, if you mean, hey, you know, there's all kinds of really bad things going on in the Old Testament. Yes, very, very bad things going on in the Old Testament, right? It's, it's, a, it's a history, right? But, I mean, you, you can take any history book and say, oh, look at all these uh, bad things going on. If you mean that things, you know, that, uh, that I say would, you know, hey, you know, I'm wondering about this. That's not just me. I mean, I'm a diagnosed psychopath, right? I don't have, I don't have uh, bad feelings uh, about these kinds of things. Uh, the reconciliation is that in the New Testament, God is defined as love, right? We're told God is love, which we only understand in a Trinitarian. It, it makes no sense for God to be love from all eternity. Uh, but in the light of the doctrine of the Trinity with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now we can see how, how God can be love from all eternity, not just, uh, not just uh, one person within God. So if Jesus says that if we're told that, that God loves everyone, one that, minute left. that we are to love everyone, that we are to harm no one, that we are to seek peace with everyone, we're told these, then I have to obey these kinds of things. And so the difficult part, the difficult part then becomes, well, what do I do about these wars and so on, given what I now believe about God? And so that's where the struggle comes in. Uh, fortunately, uh, the Bible does deal with that, right? Jesus says, Jesus says, Moses allowed divorce in these, certain, in, the, in these circumstances because of the hardness of your heart. But from the beginning, it was not so. Now look at what he said here. This is not the will of God. God is allowing certain things at certain times because of the hardness of your heart. So even according to the Bible, that is not 
the ideal situation. That is not Ten God's seconds. will for humanity. God looks down and sees a world of sinners and then has to deal with that, right? And it's not always, it's not always going to be pretty. But the New Testament affirms that the, the, the situations in the Old Testament were not always ideal. Thank you, Dr. Wood. You may ask your fifth question. Um, yes. Chapter 61, verse 14 of the Quran. Um, Allah says that he aided the true followers of Jesus until they became uppermost. Now, I suppose you can interpret that in different ways. Commentators such as Yusuf Ali interpreted it specifically to mean that Christians, the Christian followers of Jesus took over the Roman Empire and that that's how they, uh, that's how they became uppermost and, uh, and more powerful than the Jews who rejected Jesus. But we know that the Christianity that, that took over Europe, took over the Roman Empire, believed in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity, and the Trinity by the time they did. And so why would Allah help the, the wrong Christians? If there were earlier Christians who believed the right thing, why did Allah help the wrong ones, according to the Quran? According to the Quran, thank you. According to the Quran, the disciples of Jesus, the Hawariyun, were Muslim. This is the answer, okay? The Quran says, about the Hawariyun in chapter 3 of the Quran, Fashhad bi anna muslimun. Let us know, let we bear witness that we are Muslims. Meaning what? Not that they believed in Prophet Muhammad, no, that they were submitters to God. In the same way that Jesus was in John chapter 5, verse 30, I don't submit myself to my own will, but the will of God. So, why did Allah help the Hawariyun in Surah Al Saf, in chapter 61 of the Quran, or Surah Al Amran, chapter 3 of the Quran? Because they followed Jesus and he was a prophet of God and so therefore Allah he helped them because he they followed the true prophet at that time and that true prophet which we believe in as the Messiah was Jesus Christ so it was nothing to do with the Roman Empire this tafsir is null and void you will not find it anywhere of Surah Al-Saf this thing about the Roman Empire no no this one is one minute left you will not find this in Tabari you will not find this in Qurtubi you will not find this in Ibn Kathir you will not find this in any of the Mufassirin's works it's something I don't know where you've got it from, but here the, 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 the initial point is that the Hawariyun, the disciples, we have good opinion of them. Yes, and that is why I say to you, and I've been saying to you for the, for the whole uh, discussion, you will not find a polis, apostolic succession for your beliefs as a Christian. You will not find apostolic, um, you will not find an apostolic provenance back to. Jesus Christ for what you believe. You have to go further back in time. You have to back project. You have to take the ideas of the later people and basically, in, in, in Islamic terms, make tabdiyah. You have to render heretical the earlier people. We as Muslims, we believe that the earlier peoples of the prophets were the best and then they became worse as it goes on. Ten you seconds. as Christians believe in the opposite and that's a disaster of a belief. Thank you, Mr. Hijab. You may ask your sixth and final question. Related to this, I want to just ask this question one last time because I've given him many times in this debate an opportunity to ask this question, okay? My question is simple. I appreciate that early church fathers believed that Jesus was God. Some of them did believe that. Some of them believed he was God but not co-equal that he was on a hierarchy. Some of them believed he was God, but not in the same level as like subordinationism, right? I am asking a question. If they could designate Jesus as God, co-equal and co-eternal, and they use that language re respective to Jesus, can you give me one person who has interpreted the New Testament, yeah, for in the first 300 years, who has said the same thing about the Holy Spirit. Because if you cannot, the frank truth is, you have a baseless foundation for your belief. For 300 years, people would have been the farmer, as you, in your words, the farmer, the fisherman, the, the, you know, the, the butcher, the teacher, all of those individuals are damned to hell, despite the fact that they had the Gospels in front of them, because they couldn't make the natural inference of the Holy Spirit being God. Can you give me one person Church Father, first 300 years, who designated the Holy Spirit as co-equal, co-eternal, independent, the same language that they use in Nicaea for the Holy Spirit. Please do so. Uh, 
I'm shocked that people still take this seriously. Who called the Holy Spirit co-eternal? The Bible calls him eternal. The Bible calls him eternal. That language, that specific, he, he sent, here's a council in the fourth century that came up with a specific way of uh, phrasing things. Well, that was to help people avoid confusion here. So if we're saying that the Holy Spirit uh, is God, the Father is God, the Son is God, if this is revealed in scripture and there's only one God, guess what? That's what they were believing, right? If someone objects at some point and says, uh, I believe that the Holy Spirit is not eternal. Well, then in your creed, you need to clarify, hey, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. The Bible says that he's eternal, so he's co-eternal with the Father, and so they put it in a creed. Just to be clear, creeds have no authority beyond the scripture. One minute left. There's the scripture, but it's a lot. It's 66 books, covers 1,500 years, 40 different authors, right? There are threads running throughout the scripture, right? The purpose of the creed is to say, here's a little short list of the essentials. Here's a short list of the essentials to make sure that you're on the right side of being an Orthodox Christian. And so they put a little creed there just because, oh, so-and-so was coming to a different position and he's contradicting the Bible, therefore we need to, we need to make sure we mention co-eternal here, right? But the co-eternal does not come from the council. The co-eternal comes from the Bible, right? And all of the claims about the equality of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those come from the scripture, acknowledging them all as Yahweh. 10 seconds. And so you're, you're basically saying, hey, why, why are you using language of clarification later on that you didn't use <laughs> earlier? Well, the earlier people would have said, we understand he's God. So. I'm fine, man. Uh, before we start uh, our Q&A, uh, each speaker will have five minutes for hey, conclusions. Hey, wait, he started. Why shouldn't I? You can go ahead. What's that? No, no, no. I mean, he started with the question, so. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. I wasn't counting, so I wasn't counting, but. You have the sixth question, sixth and final question. Okay. Um, this is kind of a, a side issue, but I was wondering about it because, uh, uh, Muhammad, you mentioned the Ebionites as yeah. uh, early, as an early group who didn't believe in the deity of Christ. Uh, the Ebionites, as I understand them, were a group, they didn't have the Bible, they only had part of the Gospel of Matthew. So they had part of the Gospel of Matthew, and in that part of the Gospel of Matthew, they didn't even have the beginning. But they also rejected the virgin birth. They didn't believe that prophets actually got revelations from God. The prophets spoke on their own wisdom. So mm -hmm. if we're taking the Ebionites as the true followers of Christ here, won't we have to reject Islam as well? Okay, thank you. Um, now, I have never made the claim that the Ebionites are the true followers of Christ. That's something you have said. Uh, that's not something I've said. I've just made the point that they had the Islamic position on two aspects, the non-divinity of Jesus Christ and the non-divinity of the Holy Spirit. Now, they didn't have the Bible. Do you know why? Because they came before John. <laughs> they came on 70 AD. John came 95 AD. Oh man, I don't know what to say. They only had the Gospel of Matthew because only Mark, Matthew and Luke, the synoptic Gospels were available to them. They had those synoptic Gospels. Now, the thing is, when you, when you talk about what they actually believed in, I gave you a primary source material. Hippolytus, he said, who was the, who was the, the student of Irenaeus and who was the student of Justin Martyr and who taught Origin of, Clem, uh, uh, origin of Alexandria. He said in Against the Heresies, chapter 22, what they believed. You can go and check it if you don't believe me. It's a primary source material. Now, One minute left. I've got a minute. I will use the minute. Now, the, the point you said here about the Holy Spirit is absolutely null and void. Do you know how many things in the Bible are, co uh, are eternal? Look at Milchizdik. Milchizdik, he didn't have a mother. He didn't have a father. In the book of Hebrews, he was eternal. Bring him into the Trinity. Bring him into the Trinity today. Bring him into the Trinity today if that's your only parameter. If that is the only thing you have. You said God, just because something is referred to as theos in the Greek, it must be a co-eternal. Co then bring Paul in. Bring the devil in because they're called theos as well. Now... As it relates to the, how long have I got left? 
Okay, as it relates to the Holy Spirit, Gregory of Nizanzius and Gregory of Nyssa, they quote in church documents, primary source materials, you can check the website, Many Prophets, One Message, it has all the references. They quote, we didn't know, people were disputing about what the Holy Spirit is. Some said it was a creature, some said it was God, some said it was this, some said it was that. We did not know, that's what they said. It's not an argument from silence I'm making, it's an argument from evidence. Thank you very much, Mr. Hijab. Uh, uh, Dr. Wood, you may start your five-minute conclusion. We're switching. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you again. A couple side notes here. He says the Ebionites were too early. Our earliest reference to the Ebionites was from 140. Um, of course, they, they, they could be earlier, but the point is, these were people who had one part of one gospel, and there were certainly, there were certainly the rest of the gospels um, around during the time, but they are, they are regarded as a, a radical offshoot of Judaism. Um, so to lay them down as authoritative, again, these are, these are guys who didn't believe that prophets spoke from God, um, they didn't believe in the virgin birth and so on. So uh, if these guys are the closest to the true Jesus, then uh, we have to reject the Islamic Jesus. He said Melchizedek was eternal. Now you have to understand what, what the author of, of Hebrews is doing there. He's talking about the descriptions, right? Uh, uh, we, we don't have really time to go into this. Uh, if someone wants to bring it up in the Q&A, ask about Melchizedek when we can actually go what he's doing there. He is not saying that Melchizedek, Melchizedek is eternal. Uh, certainly not claiming that. Um, so... Uh, and the last point, uh, just because something is called um, a god in scripture doesn't mean it's, uh, you know, it has divine attributes and is not God. Yes, we understand the term theos and the, the term Elohim in the Old Testament can mean various things. The question is, how are these terms used of Jesus? How are these terms used of the Father? How are these terms used of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is creating the world in the Bible. The Holy Spirit is eternal in the Bible. So to just brush that off and say, well, other things are called God. Yeah, not in the same, not in that way, right? You could say, oh, those are false gods. There, you're calling them, you're, you're saying they're, they're gods in some way. You're using the term, but you're not applying it seriously. When we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these are used uh, seriously of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so as far as what we have, what we have tonight, um, again, we see in the Old Testament, we see from the opening verses of the book of Genesis and throughout the Old Testament, various uh, claims of plurality within the one God. Jewish commentators have mentioned this. Uh, modern experts in Judaism acknowledge that prior to the end of the second century, where the Jewish community swung uh, very hardly in a uh, unitarian direction, there was widespread agreement in the Jewish community. And Muhammad Hijab, how did he respond? Well, show me where they say co-equal, co-eternal, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. No one's claiming they knew that. The point was, you think they had this Tawheed-ish belief, and they just didn't, right? What did, what did the scholars say? What do various Jewish scholars say? That the doctrine that Christians believe in would have fit in very comfortably with what Jews prior to the second century had fit in. There would have been nothing there for, for a Jew to claim about, uh, to complain about in terms of theology. They would reject, they wouldn't reject it by saying, oh, that's a confusing doctrine of God, is the point. They would say, we reject Jesus as the Messiah. That would be the main complaints of uh, Jews during the time. Um, and what have we seen on the other side? Right? And here's what's interesting. Um, Christians have a lot of data, right? We have the Old Testament passages. We have Jesus coming into the world, and we see the various things that Jesus did and the claims he made, and since he rises from the dead, we have to take those claims seriously. So when he's claiming to be the final judge of all mankind, or when he's claiming to be the one who raises the dead at the resurrection, we recognize the kinds of claims that he's making. And then when we find various claims about the Holy Spirit, we take those seriously. And we say, all right, everything that God has revealed to us, we have to take seriously. And the only way to take it all seriously is with something like the doctrine of the Trinity. One minute left. We turn to Islam and we find all kinds of things that are just confusing. 
I, you know, I, I talk about Allah praying, and ah, it means sending blessings. They're perfectly, you say barakah, right? We know how to say that. Why does he use the word that's prayer? So, much, so confusing, so confusing that even Muslim translators are now translating it as Allah praying in a variety of different circumstances. Allah praying for self-control so that his mercy can triumph over his wrath. And we find this over and over again, that you have an eternal word, that there is a spirit that proceeds from within Allah, that you have a man, that his followers were, were drinking his blood. All of these things. If we said, uh, again, goddesses are interceding with you, with Allah, you would say polytheism, but the Quran is doing it in the form of birds who know things, who talk, and it's pure monotheism. Ten seconds left. And so when we see this over and over again, Islam looks like it's trying to copy Christianity, but just doing a really bad job of it. Thank you very much, Dr. Wood. How long? Five minutes. David Wood has been more interested or more concerned with trying to disprove Islam today than defending Christianity. He talks about the Ebionites as being a radical offshoot. This is an ahistoric way of rendering history. One man's uh, orthodox is another man's heresy. Gospel, gospels, he says in one other time, he says the gospels were not present at the time of the church father. This is a, this is a lie or a misreading or a misunderstanding. He should be reading his primary source materials. Almost all of them refer to the four gospels. All of the major church fathers refer to the four gospels, let's say from Justin Martyr onwards, 100%. This is something well known. Look at their works. Athanasius, he's the one who made a short list of what is going to be the Bible, right? He made a short list in mid fourth century, the 27 books of the Old Testament. Now, the question we could ask is, who gave him the authority to do that? To include in God's word, to take out of God's word, this is God's word, this is not God's word. Why is the Gospel of Thomas not in the Bible? Why is this? He's making the decision. It then became quite popular and it was an organic thing, it wasn't in the council, that these are the 27 books of the Old Testament. That's another issue. When we talk about the Bible, what are we really talking about? There's issues with the Bible, there is no chain going back to Jesus. Everything that we have called a Sahih Hadith, an authentic Hadith, has a chain going back to Prophet Muhammad or Allah. And that's what you don't have. And that's why our books are preserved and yours are not. That's another issue. He says he believes in progressive revelation in the, old, in the New Testament. Wallahi, that's very good. You know why? Because I agree with him on this point. I want to end with this. I agree with him. I believe he's right. Yes, the Bible does talk about a progressive revelation, which is why it talks about the upcoming prophet. And that's why if you read Isaiah 42, ask, answer me this, who in history has come to the Kadarites, the Arabs, has made the people of Selah, the mountaintops, rejoice? Who in history went to the Arabs and made the Arabs rejoice, defeating his enemies in military warfare? And this is not something we're shy about, by the way. This is something we're very proud of. Very proud of. This is something we're very proud of because our prophet is a winner, a military winner. It's part of his prophecy that he was going to do that. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 18 says, that there was going to be one of the ways to, to tell a true prophet is through prophecy. Every single one of the prophets, Muhammad's prophecies came true. Look at the Quran. It's a way that a, a Christian, an honest Christian can come to terms. Who is this man? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do the research. Well, he's right. There is progressive revelation, but it did not end with Jesus. It continued to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is why in the Quran it doesn't mention progressive revelation. Khatib in Nabiyin, he's the final prophet. If you really want salvation, wallahi, all that's said and done. 20 years of attacking Islam, mockumentaries, uh, you know, making fun of Prophet Muhammad, dressing up as a woman, and these things, no problem. <laughs> wallahi, I believe, I'm speaking on behalf of all the Muslims here, yes? I will forgive you and the Muslims will forgive you if you repent today. I will forgive you and the Muslims. We will forgive you if you repent today. I want to give you one piece of advice. Sorry, I'm just making a comment. I want, to I want to give the Muslims, in my concluding speech, one piece of advice, which is you'll find it in 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 15. That if someone asks you a question, you know, about what you, what you hope, you know, then speak, speak to them respectfully. Yes, honorably, respectfully. 
Mocking Muslims, you know, dressing like them and these things, that's not respectful. Be like James White. Be like William Lay Craig. We can have, we can have, more, we can have more fruitful cohesion in our communities, man. We want to have cohesion. We, as Muslims, I'm putting the, yes, I'm putting the olive branch now to the Christian community. We don't want to, we will never. The Quran says, Chapter 6, 108. Do not curse their gods. We're not allowed to curse the gods of other people. The Bible is the same, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says don't, don't curse. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Don't curse us. Don't mock us. Because like today, you will be shown the truth in a very harsh manner. You'll be shown the truth in a very, very embarrassing manner. And that is the reality, ladies and gentlemen. Come humbly. 10 seconds. You will be, come humbly and you will be received humbly. Give us your hand and we will shake it only if you respect us in the first place. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Mr. Hijab. We would like to thank both of our speakers. Uh, we're going to start taking the questions right now. So for any questions for Dr. Wood, form on the right. Any questions for Dr. Uh, Mr. Hijab, form over here, please. Not doctor yet. <laughs> All right. Dr. Wood is here. Hijab is there. Oh, OK. Just give me a minute. So it's just sort of laid back? It's sort of laid back. Right. If we can all be, try to be as quiet as we can, we're going to start our Q&A right now. Test. Is it working? Testing. Nice. First question is going to be to Brother Hijab on the right over here. This is, oh, this is for... This is for Brother Hijab. This question. Any questions for Mr. Hijab, you can start over here. Questions for Mr. Hijab, just to clarify. Questions for Mr. Hijab over here. Question for Dr. Wood will be over there. You can still ask. You wanna... She had it confused. All right, we'll, we'll start the first question. He's going to do two. So he's going to do two right okay. there. Okay. All right, yeah, sure. Okay. No, sorry. Is the mic working? Okay. Okay, please, if we can stay as quiet as possible so we can hear the question. So one thing that Dr. Wood uh, brought up multiple times during both your intro, your rebuttal, as well as your conclusion, was the fact that uh, Muslim scholars claim that companions drink the Prophet's blood. Um, with your level of intellect, I mean with Dr. Wood's level of intellect and profession, I'm sure you're well aware of one of the most basic teachings of Islam, which is regarding our diet, which is halal and haram. We're forbidden to eat any or drink any type of blood in any form. Um, if you, you know, have any doubt, you can look at Surah 6, Ayah 145. So, um, you know, with the claim about uh, Muslim scholar, scholars saying that the, prof, the companions did indeed drink the Prophet's blood, can we get one credible name that, of a scholar that did in fact say that? I'm having trouble hearing here. Do you, could you repeat like the so gist? Basically she, was, uh, basically, she was saying there's a verse in the Quran that stated that drinking blood or eating any yeah, yeah, type of... Yeah, so she, she asked if you can provide an actually proven scholar that states that the, uh, that the Sahaba 
or the companions actually drank the blood of the prophet. Is that, is, was that your question? Yes, that, that was the question, so. Oh yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the source. Okay, go ahead. You want to ask another, well, whoops. Take your time, don't worry about that. <laughs> oh, that, that's, uh, that's in, uh, that's in um, Kadi Ilya. I'm sorry? Kadi Ilya, let me, let me give you. Um, I can give you the... Uh, I think the reference would be... Um, okay, so this is uh, Ashifa by Qadi Iliad, says um, Muhammad ibn Sa'd uh, al waqidis scribe related that Aisha said to the Prophet, when you come from relieving yourself, we do not see anything noxious from you. He said, Aisha, do you not know that the earth swallows up what comes out of the prophets so that none of it is seen? Although this tradition is uh, not famous, the people of knowledge still notice the people of knowledge still mention the purity of his feces and urine. There was also the time when Malik ibn Sinan drank his blood on the day of Uhud and licked it up the prophet allowed him to do that and said, the fire will not touch you. So this is uh, pages 35 through 37 of uh, Ashifa. Thank you very much, Dr. Wood. Next question for Mr. Hijab. Go ahead. Uh, hi. <laughs> so, um, good debate and thanks. Uh, you, throughout your debate, you kept saying that there was no apostolic succession for the Trinity. And basically, until the Nicene, uh, the Council of Nicene, there was nothing about the Trinity. No, no church father has said anything between Jesus' death and 300 and whatever AD or whatever that occurred. Uh, one question for you then, can you name one person between 33 AD and 583 AD who said anything about Islam? Because there was no apostolic succession for Islam either. Sorry, what's the qu I, can't, I can't hear what, exactly what you're saying. Can you, can you repeat? Can he you... was basically saying that uh, if, you can mention, uh, if you can mention a source from 3 AD. From 33 AD, from uh -huh. 33 AD, from Jesus' crucifixion to about the time of 583 AD when, uh, the, uh, when your prophet so, began. Can you repeat what he said? Actually, I'll give him his mic. Yeah, 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 please. Yeah. But he was so, started in 583. You can actually speak into this mic. It will be more fun. Just let them come up. <laughs> they might just need to turn that mic up. Hi. So I was asking if, you know, one of your core yes. questions were, you know, what's the apostolic succession between the Trinity? Yes. You're talking about the Trinity. There was nothing mentioned by the church fathers between Jesus' crucifixion and when the Council of Nicene. Um, can you mention one person historically who has talked about the possible succession of Islam between 33 AD and 583 AD when your prophet began. When my prophet began, sorry, was it what? I don't, I don't, get, it. I don't get it, sorry. What were you saying? He's basically asking for a reference from 33 AD to 583, to 583, where oh, is it, it was mentioned that the prophecy of Islam was coming. What? Sorry? I'm really, I'm not doing this on purpose. I'm, I'm, I'm not <laughs> he wants a source where, or any, any... Is he talking about Islam or Christianity? He's talking about Islam. Okay. During 33 yes. AD. So 33 and, AD is not Islam. Yeah, I know, I know. He's saying, yes. is, was there a reference to Islam? Something to portray that would say that Islam is coming. Okay, That's yes, That's basically yes. what he's asking. Islam means submission. There's a reference to that in the Bible. John chapter 5 verse 30. Because it says, I don't submit myself to my own will, but to the will of the Father. That is Islam. Linguistically, that's what Islam means. So that's in the Bible. We don't need to go to 33 AD. Is that, is that all right? I mean, is, is that a question? Yeah, yeah, sorry. One more, one more time. I'm not understanding the question. You're saying that there's, there's nothing about the Trinity between 33 AD and about the time of the Council of Nicene. This is, your, this is the yeah. crux of your argument, or okay. one of the things you said the most. Yeah, yeah. But by that same definition, we have nothing between 33 AD that speaks anything about anything, in, well, not anything in the Quran, but most of the things in the Quran or Islam. Oh, so basically, right. okay. the apostles yes, yes. did not succeed I understand. in that. Yes, yes. Okay, as Muslims, we don't believe that the Quran was revealed to Jesus. We believe it was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, right? So obviously the Quran, because it was not revealed to Jesus, it, there would be no reference to it because it was a final testament that came afterwards, you see. So when I made my argument, I, wasn't, I did not make the argument that the Trinity was not mentioned. 
Yeah? The Trinity was mentioned by Tertullian. I, did, I mentioned that. I mentioned the Nicene Trinity of 381 and uh, after that, which stipulates very speci specific parameters as to what the Trinity is and what the Trinity isn't. That was my argument. Yeah? So I didn't say the Trinity is not there in the first, uh, whatever, 300 years. I said the Nicene Trinity wasn't there. As for Islam, my, my point was that if you don't believe that Jesus is divine and you don't believe that the Holy Spirit is divine, like many monarchists and uh, Ebonites didn't believe, then by definition you believe there's only one God worthy of worship, right? And if, that, if, if that's what you believe, then you're a Muslim in a sense because you, you're submitting yourself to one God. So from that perspective, I think the case can be made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. One question over there for Dr. Wood. All right. So um, can you hear me properly, Dr. Wood? I just want to make sure. A little bit? All right. I don't, um, I don't know if I'm in a bad spot. That's the only mic I could uh, hear really well. Just say right. it loud. Am I better now? All right. Perfect. Um, so my question is regarding the equality among the Trinity. So um, in Matthew 28, um, verse 18, Jesus says that all authority is given to him and on, in the heavens and on the earth. And then in John um, chapter 16, verse 13, it states that, but when the spirit of truth comes, he will, be, um, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak on what he hears. So if the Holy Spirit is God, why doesn't he have any authority to speak? Thank you. Uh, if, you look at, if you look at how um, the Gospel of John uh, is using these terms, it's the, the emphasis in these passages is not, is not uh, that the Holy Spirit is not God or that Jesus is not God. He's trying to show that they are one. Right? In other words, in John chapter 5, right? uh, M Muslims love to bring up John chapter 5, where Jesus says, uh, of my own self I can do nothing. Check, check. It's working. He says, of my own self I can do nothing. And they say, aha, right there, which is parallel to the Spirit doesn't speak on his own, on his, on his own authority. Right? If you look at what's actually going on there, um, at the beginning of John, I mean, or earlier in John chapter 5, because Jesus is calling himself the Son and saying that uh, he can work on the Sabbath because the Father does. Notice, Jews are not allowed to work on the Sabbath. Jesus says, but the Father works on the Sabbath and so do I, right? When he said that, they accused him of claiming to be another God, right? He's a rogue deity, right? He's, a, he's separate. So what he does there in the rest of John chapter 5, that's where he claims to, that he's the one who raises the dead at the resurrection. He says that he's the one uh, who is the final judge. And he says that um, we have to honor him just as we honor the Father, right? So keep in mind, we have to, you would only honor someone the same way you honor the Father if he has the same nat nature and attributes as the Father. So when he says, when he says that he can do nothing of himself, or when the Holy Spirit does not, not speak on his own authority, what these are saying is they don't do these things separately as separate deities from the Father, because that's the accusation. As soon as you start saying some things are divine, they start accusing of saying there's other gods. So the emphasis is he doesn't do this on his own. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Wood. Uh, we're past the halfway mark right now in the Q&A, so we're gonna try to speed it up as much as we can, so we'll, we'll limit each answer to one minute. Uh, uh, for both speakers. So I think uh, the next uh, question is for Mr. Hajab. You can go ahead and speak. Yes. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Hajab. I was wondering, since the thrust of your argument hinges on David's inexpert, flawed knowledge of Arabic, don't you think it's a little odd that the will of God can only be discerned by people who speak an esoteric language spoken by less than 5% of the popula world population? and which has many dialects and isn't even spoken by the majority of self-professed Muslims. And what do you think of the fact that there are people who are very learned in Arabic, who were even born in Arabia, who have the same epistemological, moral, scientific, and historical critiques of the Quran? Thank you for your question. Um, your question was about the Arabic language of the Quran. And you were saying that, is it, is it the case that only Arabs can access the Quran in a nutshell? Is it, why is it that only 5% of the population can access this and the rest cannot? Now, 
there's a difference between understanding the fundamentals of a religion, yes, and trying to do exegesis. Yes, exegesis is when you try hermeneutically to go into the text and understand it holistically. And for that, you require language ability. For that, you require, whether you're doing it with the Bible or the Quran, you require to have some kind of ability to understand the language. Otherwise, your hermeneutic will be necessarily limited. Now, just quickly, as I do have a little bit of time, Answering the question or, or the point on, on John uh, that, uh, that David talked about. Don, John chapter, 10, seconds, John chapter 10 verse 34, Jesus clearly says, why do you call me God? I mean, they were about to stone him and he said this. And he's, really, he's referencing Psalms uh, 82. So if he really believed he's God, then why is he saying, didn't, uh, didn't you say this of old? Like, ye are gods. You, ye are gods. In other words, it's a language of the people. And that's one of the biggest problems. Sorry, Doc. Sorry. Time's up. Sorry. Apologies. <laughs> go ahead. Um, you can go ahead. Question for Dr. Wood. I have one question for you. It has three co equal parts, but I assure you that it's just one question. Try to keep it to one. We're trying to get as much as we can. Three is one. <laughs> you can go ahead. <laughs> Can I ask it? Go ahead. Would you agree that the concept of the Trinity has evolved over time? What do you say about Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 to 19, where it says, I warn everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book, etc., etc., etc. And can you explain Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, where Jesus says, I never knew I never knew you get away from me. Well, there he says not everyone who says not everyone who says to me lord lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but only those who do the will of my father. Um, so he will say um, I I never knew you. Uh, I don't understand what what the problem is there. Um, Jesus calls himself lord but he's saying not not you don't just call him lord and then and then you're fine. Um, what was the other part? Um, what do you, uh, would you agree that the concept of Trinity has evolved over time? Oh, no, the, the, the clarification of the concept, right? Uh, keep in mind, wh whether you're talking about the Quran, whether you're talking about the Bible, you have historical events, you have uh, revelations from prophets, statements, and so on. Um, and if you're coming up with a creed, you're trying to clarify it. You're trying to make it as concise as possible. So, uh, yeah, they had, to they had to figure out how to say things in using certain terms in language, but uh, I, I, the triune God is eternal, right? The triune God is eternal. Our, our descriptions, our descriptions may take time, but that's not, it, that's not the Trinity evolving. That's our concepts being clarified. And what about the third part where I said, what do you say about Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 to 19, where it says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book, etc., etc. Well, the, 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 the book of Revelation, it, it, the author didn't know he's going to be writing the last book of the Bible. He's talking about his prophecy, his prophecy in book of Revelation. Don't take my prophecy and add a bunch of words to them. So he's just saying, hey, don't add to my prophecy here and, and act like it's my prophecy. That doesn't mean you can't clarify uh, concepts, right? So, All right, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, question for Mr. Hijab. Yes. Yeah, question for Mr. David. I'm sorry? I have a question for Mr. Wood. For Mr. Wood? We would have to take a question from Mr. Hijab first. Anyone wants to answer a question? You can go ahead. Hello, Mr. Hijab. I had a question for you. Uh, yes. Um, are you certain that you will be going to heaven, uh, Jannah, as according to Islam says? You yourself? No. Does that concern you? Maybe David will go to heaven and I will go to hell. Does that's, that... a, that's a possibility. Mm. You know, I mean, I, as a Muslim, as a Muslim, I can't guarantee. And you know, Christians say, Christians say that, you know, God, this is one of the arguments, that you can't guarantee yourself the kingdom of heaven, yeah? Yeah, that's true, that's, that, that's true. What, why is that amount to the falsity of Islam? I mean, what logical reasoning is that anyways? The point is, say for instance, you're a Christian and you believe that if you're a Christian, you're going to go to heaven. 
But even according to your own belief system, there is a possibility, a logical, rational possibility, that for instance, you'll die upon Hinduism or atheism or, Ju or Judaism. And in which case, you will have to, you have to conclude that you cannot be perfectly sure that you're going to uh, heaven. Because that would mean that you have perfect knowledge of the future. And not only uh, do you not have that perfect knowledge, not, uh, not even the Holy Spirit had that knowledge. Thank you very much, Mr. Hijab. You may ask your question for Dr. Wood. Oh, real quick, yeah. You said in the beginning that God uh, was in the heaven and he was, his, the spirit was hovering of, uh, over the heaven. And it was a mystery and the mystery was supposed to be uh, revealed. But it went on and more into dark, the mystery never got explained. If I am if I'm pushed towards believing God to be a mystery, it would be Hinduism, wherein God comes through multiple incarnations to uh, earth in order to fix people. Uh, does that mean Christianity is a subset of Hinduism, wherein it claims Jesus came as the incarnation of God? Did you get that? I can't like half of it. No. You got that? In Hinduism, it is a common belief that God comes as incarnations, mm -hmm. and I suppose you also believe that Jesus came as incarnation of God onto the earth to fix people and to teach the morality. Does that mean Christianity is a subset of Hinduism in terms of its beliefs? No. <laughs> uh, you can't say anyone who believes in an incarnation is uh, a subset of Hinduism. Uh, if someone who's never heard one single thing about Hinduism, which would have been first century Jews, uh, believe in an incarnation, uh, has nothing, has nothing to do with, uh, with Hinduism. Just because you have um, some sort of parallel in some way, uh, like, oh, but there are many religions that believe in rising from the dead. It doesn't mean they all stole it from each other. Um, so, no. Uh, next question for Mr. Hijab. Oh yeah, oh yeah, guys. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thanks, David thank Wood you, and thank you. Mohammed. And yeah. uh, so my question is, like, there was a question that uh, David Wood asked about uh, the fact that the Quran says that. About sorry. Oh, uh, the Quran says that uh, the followers of Jesus were supposed to be uppermost. Yes. And uh, and so, like, I, I was wondering what your understanding of that is, because I thought that them being uppermost would be that they are the ones who are going to overcome over the disbelievers. And so we obviously yes. know that Christ, the, the Christians who were there during Muhammad's time believed in the Trinity. And so like I was just wondering what happened to Jesus' disciples according to Islam and why did they, why were they not able to counter the false yes. disciples? Well, in the Quran it says about this, it says, وَجَاعِلُوا الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوكَ فَوْقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Talking about the Hawariyun, it says that we're going to make them higher than those who have disbelieved until the day of judgment. Yes? So it's talking about the disciples of Jesus. We believe that those early Christians were on the truth. Let me repeat. The Quran says very clearly that those Christians will go to heaven. Those Christians will go to heaven. They believed in Christ. They were followed Christ, they believed in his law, etc. Now, there's a difference now, there's a point of demarcation between the early Christians, the uh, disciples, and then the church fathers, and then those who came after those. So the, the point is, as Muslims, our creed is, we believe Jesus was innocent of all of this, that his followers were innocent of all of this, and that, he, and that they are people who are honored in Islam. And whoever says anything wrong about the disciples in Islam has left Islam. Because there's something in Islam, yes, which is very clear. It's a, it's a clear point of aqidah for us. Yes, if anyone curses the, the Hawariyun, the disciples, this is kufr. Because Allah, He says, which means disbelief. At the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, The ones who say that Jesus is God, they, have, they, are, they are disbelievers as well. So it can't be both ways. It can't be both. Thank you very much. One question for Dr. Wood. Uh, before I begin, David Wood said that the companions of the Prophet deified uh, the Prophet. 
Well, when he died, Abu Bakr told the people, he told the people that the Prophet has passed away, but God is alive and he can never die. Sahih Bukhari, Book 64, Hadith 472. Now, before, that was just a clarification. My question is, in the Old Testament, God says he is not a man, Hosea 11.9, and he is not the son of a man, Numbers 23 and 19, and he has full knowledge, Psalms 147. Jesus is a man, he calls himself the son of man, and he doesn't know everything. Christians will say that was before he took on a body and he took on the attributes of man, but doesn't this contradict Malachi 3.6 where the Lord says he does not change? It was like 12 things. Yeah, it was one thing. Just try to answer whatever you can. All right. Uh, as far as, yeah, we, I understand that Muhammad has died. The, the problem is that Islam keeps taking these things like the Black Stone and the Kaaba and Muhammad and treating them in a way that is far beyond what you would expect for a, for a mere creation. So yes, I understand, you know, Muhammad died and he's not a, a god in that sense. I'm saying they're showing reverence that should never be shown to a mere human being. Um, as far as uh, God not being a man or the, or the, or the son of man, uh, if you look what's, what's being said there, God is asked to change his mind. He said God is not a man that he should, that he should change his mind. Um, so it's saying his character is not going to change, which is the same thing you find in Malachi. God is not going to change his character or in that way. It doesn't mean God can never do something different in some way or that God uh, can't, um, can't enter creation. He starts, he enters creation repeatedly in Genesis, right? He walks in the garden with Adam. So he appears to Abraham. So God does, it. that's not what they're talking about as far as, um, as far as God changing. That was the best I could do in one minute. That's good. One question for Mr. Hijab. Uh, thank you, great debate. Uh, Mr. Hijab. Sorry? Yes. Sorry? If, yes. Um, if, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, uses the Bible as his basis to validate his prophethood, especially in the words of Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ said, I'm going to the Father and I'll send to you a comforter, the spirit of truth who will be with you and teach you into all truth. Like one of your famous apologists, uh, Ahmed Gidat, refers to that scripture as the validation yeah. for Prophet Muhammad's um, like prophethood. Now, what do we make of what Jesus Christ said emphatically to his disciples that they should go and wait upon him in Jerusalem and then the spirit will come on them? And in the book of Acts, we witness a spectacle where the Holy Spirit comes to the disciple as clothing tongues on fire and we see a significant transformation from in the lives of the disciples and from there even the Roman government could not resist the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit at work in the disciples and over the years Christianity has spread not by sword but by the demonstration of the love power of the Holy Spirit how do we reconcile these demonstrations of the Holy Spirit Thank in you. reference to uh, what there's Muhammad there's said a lot Thank of things you. in there so let me try and cover them I just, uh, just one request. We, I yeah. think we're gonna after this, we're gonna have to take just two more questions and try to keep your questions like, like you know, as simple as possible. Don't because you know we're trying to take as much questions as we can, but you know it's impossible with you stretching the questions like that because we have limited time. So, okay. So, so there are a few points. First thing he said is about taking the Bible as an authority. Yes, the Quran says the Injil, the Torah, but the original one sent to Moses and Jesus, and the evidence of that is chapter five, verse forty-six where it talks about qaffayna man ba'dihim bi Isa ibn Maryam and then it goes wal yahkum ahlu al-injil bima anzala Allah fi the lam here is a lam ta'liliya al-qurtubi says this meaning it goes back to the previous passage and the next verse chapter 5 verse 48 says wa muhaymanan alayh that the Quran is a guardian over the Bible yes this book is a guardian over this so it is an authority in as much as it does not contradict the Quran according to the Quran now that's point 1 point 2 about Christianity not being spread by the sword is a misreading of history actually if you look at Constantine and the Theodosian code actually the only way Christianity spread through the Roman Empire was through the sword look at the uh, primary source material about the Theodosian code from Theodosius Theodosius the second he enforced Nicene Trinitarianism 
by force, according to all of the historians, across the whole of the Roman Empire until the pagan religions of the Romans were completely dissipated. Not to mention, of course, colonialism. Not to mention, of course, the Spanish the colonists. Not to mention, of course, one of the biggest, one of the biggest casualties in war in human history, yes, one of the biggest, was when the Spanish Empire and the French Empire and the British Empire spread it to your country in Africa. It spread it everywhere. Don't tell me it wasn't spread by the sword. Don't tell me it wasn't spread by the sword. What are you talking about? The difference between Islam and Christianity in this regard was that Islam spread organically, whereas Christianity required a man who was an empire at that time to spread it forcefully. We fought, as Muslims, the bigger enemy. You were the bigger enemy fighting the smaller people. That's the difference. Don't tell me about these things. This is a, don't misread history. Thank you, Brother Hijab, for your answer. Uh, we'll take a question for Dr. Wood. Dr. Wood, it's an honor to be here. I want to first thank Can you. Can you speak closer into the mic, please? I want to first thank you. I converted to Christianity this year, January 1st, and part of it was because of the answers that you have given me, so thank you. Um, I've watched a lot of your debates with Shabir Ali and others. Mr. Hijab is talking about William Lane Craig and how respectful they are, but I mean, if this doesn't work out, maybe you can do some stand-up comedy. But, but you asked me, you asked somebody asked about Melchizedek. So could you please explain who Melchizedek was in the Old Testament? Thank you. Oh, with, with, uh, with Melchizedek. Um, well, we're down to one minute now. But uh, if you look at what uh, the author of Hebrews is doing, um, he's saying that the, the Jews already had their own uh, uh, priesthood, the, the Levitic priesthood. But the Messiah is going to be from the order of Melchizedek. So he basically says, what are the differences in the descriptions in scripture? He, he, this is a guy who reads kind of codes into the Bible, right? He, he's looking for codes in the scripture. They took this very seriously. Um, so he says, what's the difference in the description textually between Melchizedek and, uh, and Levi? And that's going to tell us something about the Messiah. So he starts doing this, aha. Well, we have a genealogy for Levi. We have none from Melchizedek, right? And so he starts going down the list, and then he draws a meaning out of it. He's not actually saying that he's eternal or something like that. He's saying, according to these passages, we can learn something. And his conclusion is that the Messiah is eternal, not that, not that, not that uh, Melchizedek is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Wood, for your answer. Um, so, Hello. Uh, Mr. President, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. President. Mr. President, so this is the final question. Yes. Okay. Uh, a question oh, for Brother Hijab. Okay. Yeah. A question for uh, Mohammed Hijab. Yeah. Uh, you, sir, have been uh, complaining that David Wood uh, mocked Muslims. Sorry. You have complained that Mr. Wood have mocked Muslims. Yeah. And you have been mocking him all night. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. My question goes around to authority. You have been attacking the authority of Christians. On which authority we base our faith on Trinity? Sorry? Yes. Okay. And you seems like you believe in church more than Christians do. And let me tell you why, because you ask for church authorities, church scholars, Christians who have somehow in certain time talked about uh, the Trinity. Let me tell you and teach you something about Christianity tonight. Uh -oh. I'm willing to learn from you. Go Our ahead. authority, number one, is Jesus Christ. Our authority is the Bible. So when we cite scriptures, we're citing a lot more than Augustine that you worship. Okay, okay. can you put the question Mr. Wood clearly? said, uh, Genesis 1, 26. A woman can speak uh, here, right? Shh. Um, is okay. So, I'm sorry, uh, let, her, let her pose a question. Go ahead. Genesis 1, 26 yeah. says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. 
And 27 says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God is speaking by himself. Sorry, what okay. was the verse? He's plural. Question? And he calls himself him. So, yeah. either you believe in Genesis, no if you believe in Moses, on, which wrote this. the Genesis, or you don't believe and you're a bad Muslim too. Okay. Um, and there goes the question yeah, to authority go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, yeah. of your faith. I want to understand how is that you claim authority on Mohammed yeah. who had a, yeah. in, among multiple wives a wife Aisha yeah. according to some six years old according to others settle nine. down please please settle down I want to understand I want to understand because, because I've heard him before in a video. Excuse, excuse me, excuse me, miss. You either ask a question. This is not a debate. Yeah, you're not, answer. you are not debating. You either ask a question yeah. or you leave. That's my answer. That's my answer. You either ask a question or you leave. Thank you very much. Okay. No, no. No, no. Uh, actually, behind you. No, no. Behind am, you. I, am I not going to answer no, no, a question? No, 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 no. Can I, can I answer a question? Actually, before, before that happens, we have Mr. Hijab. He wants to answer the question here. But it's yeah. Uh, why do I, why do, why am I firm and assertive with David Wood? It's because he spent 20 years of his life mocking Muslims and Islam, accumulating more than 50 million, 60 million channel views attacking Muslims in Islam, which has led to brothers and sisters of mine being attacked on roads in this country, exacerbating Islamophobia. This man is not going to get nice treatment from me. He's not going to get it. This guy is not James White. This guy is not William Lane Craig. This guy is not respectable. So he will not be treated with respect. Now, he, now just because your boy was smashed, to use Khabib's words, it doesn't mean now that you're, you're gonna give me a, a right, can yes. Can you please settle down, please settle yes. down. Yes. Now, point number two. Point, yeah, point number two. She mentioned many things, multiple wives. Well, look at, the, look at the Old Testament, please. You, so you were talking about the Old Testament. Abraham had three wives. Solomon had 300 wives. But, but, I mean, look. You're very lucky that Islam capped it at four because if it was in Solomon's time, there would be 300. Now, really and truly now, I don't understand why, why you must be very upset with me like this. I mean, why were you not upset with David Wood when he was mocking the Muslims for, for, for 10 years? Why? You are a hypocrite. You, miss, are a hypocrite. Okay. Get the next question. Okay, Mr. Hijab. Okay. I, I want to... I want to end this... I want to end this on a good note, so we have one question. No, no, this side, this side. This side, this side. We're, we're trying to get him first. We'll get, we'll get you after. Go ahead. Assalamualaikum, Mahmoud. Um, what percentage, what percentage of Christians had memorized the entire Holy Bible? I guess that's for you, Dr. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm following the rules and everything. This is David Wood. Yeah. Oh, I am <laughs> All right, can you please, can you please settle down so Dr. Wood can answer the question? What I know is that uh, most of the Muslims memorize the Quran quickly. And do you know any Muslims, that, any uh, Christians that memorized the Bible quickly, or uh, any any percent of them? Well, the the Quran is designed for an oral culture to be memorized easily, right? I mean, yeah. right? Okay. No, no. Please, please settle down. Please settle down. Be respectable. No. Please. There, I'm not going to destroy the memory of the book. There are hundreds of thousands of people who have memorized Dr. Seuss's Green Eggs and Ham. Does that make it the word of God, ladies and gentlemen? I'm trying to be respectful here to, to, because these are young guys here. Christi in Christianity, the Bible is meant to be a book that's read, right? That, that's the idea. They, they, they wrote creeds, and you would memorize creeds. We have some of them. They wrote songs. They memorized songs. but. The, the books of the Bible are written down to be books and to be read in public. The Quran, the Quran is meant to be, is meant to be, is meant to be memorized. 
So there are different kinds of scripture. Why you would say, oh, a book that's more memorizable or something like that is must be more the word of God or something. Again, that would make green eggs and ham much, much more the word of God than the Quran because it's much, much no, he said he easier to understand. Oh, by, by the way, a little side note as far as mocking Muslims because it's been brought up like a thousand times. I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't responded. Um, I mock teachings of Muhammad, right? Like, like dunking flies and drinks and uh, things like that. And if you say that's not what I read about mockery in the Muslim sources, right? I mean, when there was a polytheist there, Abu Bakr said, go suck a lot's, close your ears if you're a child. He said, go suck a lot's clitoris to one of the polytheists. They're mocking the beliefs of the polytheists. Over and over again, we find them mocking the beliefs. If mockery is bad, then you've condemned your own God and your own prophet. So, okay, please settle down. Please, please settle down. Please settle down. Please settle down. Seriously, this is not, you guys claim to be Muslims. This is not how Muslims act. This is not how Muslims act. You guys want to represent Islam? We have Brother Muhammad Hijab here. He's done a very excellent job. You're basically undoing everything that he has done tonight. Please be respectful. And we're going to end our Q&A session right here. Thank you very much for coming. We're going to have food in the cafeteria right across in the academic core building. Thank you very much for coming, York College Muslim Student Association. Thanks both Dr. Wood and Brother Muhammad Hijab. Thank you so much.